We are live. All right. I'd like to welcome everyone to the May 17th uh, City Council meeting. And we'll start with our Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to ask Council Member Bracco to lead us in the pledge. Yes. Please stand and join me in saluting our great flag. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Invocation, I think. I don't, we don't have an invocation today. Um, city clerk's report and posting of the agenda and roll call. Tonight's meeting agenda was posted on Wednesday, May 12th at 3.42 p.m. Council member uh, Armendariz? Present. Council member Rocco? Here. Council member Hilton? Here. Council member Lero, Lero Munoz? Present. Council member Marks? Present. Council Member Tovar. Council Member Tovar. Um, and Mayor uh, Blankley. Here. Okay, under orders of the day, I'd like to request, and this is at the request of the applicant, that we move item 10A, which is SB 612, the Portentino Bill, to just after consent. Is that okay with everyone? And that's because the uh, someone is here from South Valley Clean Energy who would like to speak, uh, preferably not at the end of the meeting. <laughs> so, okay, so we'll move item 10A to right after consent. All right, all council members are participating remotely pursuant to the governor's executive order number N2920 in order to minimize the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The meeting is being live streamed from the city website, cityofgilroy.org, and is view viewable on cable channel 17 and on Facebook Live. Public comments can be made during the meeting by watching the meeting online on Zoom at https colon forward slash forward slash rb.gy forward slash mtrtjg or by calling. 669-900-6833 using meeting ID 885-2269-3404 and passcode 491830. When I call the item you wish to speak on, press star nine on your telephone keypad or use the raise your hand icon. Okay. I'm sorry, ask council members if item 10A could be, yeah, I just did that. All right, employee introductions. Uh, I don't think we have any, is that correct? Okay, so ceremonial items, moving on to proclamations, awards, and presentations. There are four. I'm gonna start with Bicycle Awareness Month. Whereas the city of Gilroy joins cities and counties throughout the county, in promoting May as National Bike Month and the 21st of May, 2021, as Gilroy Bike to Wherever Day, and whereas Gilroy acknowledges that walking and bicycling are successful transportation modes that promote healthy living, alleviates traffic and parking congestion, reduces air pollution, and decreases fuel consumption, and whereas both National Bike Month and Bike to Wherever Day are effective in converting drivers into pedestrians, bicyclists, and educating citizens about the environmental importance of walking and biking to school or work regularly, and whereas Gilroy's efforts to promote Bike to Wherever Day 2021 include an energizer station at the Miller Avenue and Ubus Levy Trail Junction, staffed by the Bicycle Pedestrian Commission and volunteers, and whereas local bicycle advocate Eugene Vernoski has been nominated by the Bicycle Pedestrian Commission as the Bicycle Person of the Year for his efforts in providing community services in the form of fixing and refurbishing donated bikes to give back to Gilroy citizens without bicycles in their possession and having the need for such bicycles for recreation and work. And whereas Eugene has also gone beyond, above and beyond, in also engaging the Gilroy community and its citizens by helping effectively organize 
Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition events for the benefit of all who choose to participate. The city council wishes to recognize him for his efforts. Now, therefore, I, Marie Blankley, mayor of the city of Gilroy, on this 17th day of May, 2021, along with my colleagues on the city council, as mayor, do hereby proclaim the month of May, 2021, as Bicycle Awareness Month. <laughs> Is Eugene or someone from Bike and Ped here tonight? No? All right, well, Eugene still has my bike and my husband's bike in his possession. So I can attest to all the work he's doing with bikes. Let me tell you. All right, congratulations on that. All right, I'm moving on to um, our next proclamation, which is National Public Works Week. Whereas public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities, and services that are of vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health high quality of life and well-being of the people of state of California. And whereas these infrastructure, facilities, and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings and other structures and facilities essential for our citizens. And whereas it is in the public interest for the citizens, civic leaders and children in the city of Gilroy to gain knowledge of and to maintain an ongoing interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas the year 2021 marks the 61st annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association, be it now. Now, therefore, I, Marie Blankley, Mayor of the City of Gilroy, California, do hereby designate the week May 16th through the 22nd, 2021, as National Public Works Week in the City of Gilroy, to all citizens to join with representatives of the American Public Works Association and government agencies in activities, events, and ceremonies designed to pay tribute to our public works professionals, engineers, managers, and employees, and to recognize the substantial contributions they make to protecting our national health, safety, and quality of life. Daryl, would you like to say something after Mayor all Blankley. that? <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Well done. Well done. Uh, I wrote I, it. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Great writing skills, Mayor. Yeah, right. You just give me a minute. I'll give a brief uh, breakdown of our different divisions and some recognition. Um, as, as far as our water section goes, it's uh, managed by Jeff Castro and our water department. City of Gilroy Water Division is made up of 13 full-time staff members, 11 hold certificates with the State Water Resources Control Board. The water team services and maintains the largest groundwater system in all of Santa Clara County here in our town. The system is made up of nine wells and approximately 203 miles of water mains throughout our city. 15,200 water services that they maintain, by the way. Our streets and sewer departments and tree section, uh, they are managed by Mr. Bill Avila. This section consists of 12 full-time members, nine of which have their CWEA certifications. The street manages approximately 16,000 city trees, 163 miles of sanitary sewer mains, with 13,342 residential connections, 835 commercial industrial connections, and 24 institutional customers. So they have a, a lot of work that they're involved with. Our park section is led by uh, Mr. Bill Headley. The City of Gilroy's park and landscape section consists of seven full-time and three part-time staff members. Staff maintains all city parks. That's 21 parks in total, including trails, pathways, and landscaped areas. And then our engineering section is led by our city engineer, Gary Heap. The engineering group has 10 full-time staff members with five holding down professional engineering licenses from the state. The staff consists of a development capital improvement traffic inspection teams. This section oversees the design of new track development, 270 lane miles of roads within our city, 33 traffic signals, 4,000 street lights, and a five-year, $76 million capital improvement program. Last but not least, our uh, fleet and facility staff do a great job of keeping us on the road and keeping the lights on. And finally, Mayor, uh, of interesting note, in 2003, President George Bush, through a Homeland Security Directive, declared that the term first responder included public works staff 
within this group who provides immediate support, service during prevention, response, and recovery operations, as well as emergency management. I'd like to express our city's appreciation for all of our public works staff during the National Public Works Week and during the essential work during the pandemic. We have all uh, persevered through and the support of our council. Thank you very much. That's awesome to hear. You know, Jeff Castro and his wife were in marriage prep with my husband and I, and we're both still married, 26 years. So that was great. <laughs> That's success right there. <laughs> All right, I got a text message from Eugene that he's here. I don't know if, um, Eugene, do you, do you wanna just uh, give a word of thanks? Uh, does, uh, uh, Christina, do you see Eugene Bernoski in the house? Okay, if not, I'm gonna move on, but he's texting that he's here. If he's on the panelists, he should be able to unmute himself, um, but I don't see him on the attendees. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Eugene, thank you. We know you're out there and thank you, thank you. All right, I'm uh, moving on to the next. We have two proclamations for um, Girl Scout Awards. So, I'm, and they, I believe are both here too. So um, get ready, Madison Hammer and Lauren DeRosa. All right, whereas Madison Hammer began her scouting journey in kinder as a daisy with troop 60493 in Gilroy. And whereas Madison grew through the ranks of Girl Scouts and received her Girl Scout bronze and silver awards. And whereas Madison earned the most highly regarded Girl Scout gold award titled Operation Democracy on December 11th, 2019. And whereas Madison hosted a week long event at her school informing local high school students of the importance of their voice and the value it holds when they vote. And whereas Madison invited local city council and board members to an interview panel at a school assembly to discuss important topics and additionally helped pre-register students for the next election to automatically become registered voters after their 18th birthday. Now, therefore, I, Marie Blankley, mayor of the city of Gilroy on behalf of the entire city council, do hereby wish to recognize Madison Hammer for achieving the award of distinction of Girl Scout Gold Award. Yay, Madison, are you are you here and able to unmute yourself? Hi, yes I am. Oh, hi, here you are. Thank you so much. Okay, <laughs> you're welcome. Congratulations, the, the formal proclamation will be headed your way if you don't already have it, if your mom hasn't picked it up, okay. <laughs> okay, and the next one, um, Whereas Lauren DeRosa began her scouting journey in sixth grade as a cadet with Girl Scout Troop 60493 in Gilroy, California. And whereas Lauren grew through the ranks of Girl Scouts and received her Girl Scout Silver Award. And whereas Lauren earned the most highly regarded Girl Scout Gold Award titled Teen Impact Week on November 12th, 2020. And whereas Lauren partnered with Impact Teen Drivers, whose mission is to prevent the deaths of youth to prevent the deaths of youth people from reckless or distracted driving. And whereas Lauren created a school curriculum to encourage responsible driving for teens that schools can implement in 30 minute increments throughout five days, creating a fun filled week. And whereas Lauren modeled the program from a nationwide program that encourages teenagers in middle school and high school to be safe passengers and responsible drivers as they learn how to manage a vehicle. Now, therefore, I, Marie Blankley, Mayor of the City of Gilroy, on behalf of the entire City Council, do hereby wish to recognize Lauren DeRosa for achieving the Award of Distinction of Girl Scout Gold Award. Lauren, are you, yeah, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you oh, yeah. so much, Mayor Blankley. It's an <laughs> honor. Congratulations, and thank you both for being here, taking your time. We have to be here, but it's nice to see you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, that was fun. All right, that's it for the fun guys. Now, this is a public comment time for anything that is not on the agenda. If, if any member of the public would like to speak on something not on the agenda, but within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city of Gilroy, um, Christina, this would be the time to let them in. If you wish to speak on an item um, not on the agenda, please raise your hand or unmute yourself by pressing star nine. We have um, 
Phone number 408-206-0618. You may speak now. Good evening, council members and Mayor Blankley. This is Susan Mister. Um, I realize that you do not have to comment on something in this um, part of the agenda, but it is something I think that you will have an answer to, if not the council member, certainly Jimmy. Um, so a year ago or so, maybe perhaps a little more than that, but when Mayor Velasco was uh, seated, um, you, I believe there was a yes vote to name uh, First Street after a Veterans Memorial Parkway or Veterans Memorial Highway. Um, and I see nothing on either end of First Street. And I'm wondering where we are in that process of naming First Street, um, commemorating and honoring our veterans. Okay, thank you, Susan. Um, Jimmy, do you have someone who can get back to her on that? Because I know we did talk about that, yeah. Yes, Madam Mayor, uh, ironically, I just spoke with our Public Works Director a few yeah. days ago about this, and he's on here, so he might be able to give you just a quick update. Well, or, okay, if it, go ahead, <laughs> if you'd like to do it that way. Sure, Mayor. Um, we contacted my uh, folks out at the yard. We're locating the signage that we need to have put up, and we're scheduling that now. So as soon as we actually have dates when staff will be out there, we can make that public. Right. Yeah, that was already addressed and was already voted on. It just the signs aren't up yet. So, yes, okay, yeah. thank you mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes, we have Jan Guffey. Um, you may speak now. Okay, is maybe not there. Okay. Um, there she is. Okay. So, uh, on next door north side, I live off of Montelli, but um, the people there are lots of people complaining about hu very loud fireworks noises. And I know after living in another community where it was a big problem, um, to the people that are really um, their quality of life is definitely impacted by. Um, whatever kinds of fireworks are going off, not just on 4th of July, but on uh, other occasions intermittently. So that's a, an issue that I know will take a while to get resolved, but I just wanted to um, voice my support for people that are dealing with that issue. Thank you very much for that. It is an issue for a lot of people. If only we could get the people doing it, know who is doing it. Um, is, uh, I don't know, Jimmy, do you want to address that or do you want to uh, have, uh, is somebody here who can say what it is we, no, I don't mean from the council. Um, I mean, I it's not on the that. agenda. I'm sorry? It's not on the agenda. Do we address it? It's public no. comment, right? No, what I, I didn't mean to address now, just like the last time I meant for somebody to be able to get back to her on the subject. That's what I tried to do with the last item that was raised too. Right. Madam that, Mayor, we can't have a real discussion, but that question. No, I, I'm just asking if somebody can can own getting back to the caller on this item. <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, thank you, thank you, caller. All right, are there any other calls or uh, comments? We do not. No. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, then we're moving on to item A, which is Art and Culture Commission annual presentation to the council. Melanie Rainison. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm happy to um, present to you tonight. Um, as you know, we've been also doing Zoom. So this is our group photo <laughs> of our Arts and Culture Commission um, team a very diverse group, all passionate about the arts and culture um, and promoting it within our city, um, especially after the year we've had with the pandemic. So first is myself, Melanie Rainison, chair. Um, Nancy Fierro is vice chair. Nellie Bermudez, Judy Bozo, Camille McCormick, uh, Federico Saldana, and Edgar Zaldana. 
Um, our mission statement is in partnership with the city council, the arts and culture commission promotes the arts in the Gilroy community to be an advocate for cultural and artistic activities in the Gilroy community. Uh, to build bridges and promote communication through cultural and artistic opportunities for all individuals, thereby improving the quality of life in our city. Next slide. Um, our work plan consists of um, several items. Um, first is the GPS art trail map, which is um, an ongoing effort um, working with uh, Miguel Contreras um, we're going to be collecting GPS coordinates of public art throughout the city. Um, from my understanding, it's going to be kind of a citywide map with the bike trails, bike repair stations, um, dog park, all those things, um, maybe public restrooms, I'm not sure what else, but we wanted to incorporate the public art throughout the city. And um, it's going to be a great way to kind of record what we have. And some people may not know we have this much art throughout the city already existing. So we really want to highlight that. And also, it's we're trying to do our work plan in conjunction in conjunction with um, council initiatives. So this one is public engagement. Um, the next one is the bench pack program which is an ongoing program we actually had with the Public Art Committee, and it's our only fundraising effort at this time. Um, right now we have 17 benches remaining um, for people to choose from. We've updated to include the new city parks, uh, Sydney Casper, Gateway Park, and um, it's been a really popular way for people to um, do a memorial or to recognize someone. So it's been another one that's also public engagement. Uh, next slide. The next one is our arts and cultural award. Um, this one, we are we didn't do one last year just because of with the pandemic and everything. But this year we had a nomination to do a memorial recognition award, and the. Um, person we would like to award is Donald Prieto, which many of you know, I think a lot of people throughout the city recognize Donald, Donald Elvis. Um, he has brought so much to our city through his artistic performance, and we really want to do this memorial award for him that will be presented in the future. So I think it's on our agenda for our next meeting, um, but we want to have it presented to him, hopefully at a city council meeting in the future. Uh, next is our high school art show, which um, our commission members are, are passionate about this one. Um, as you know, high school has been distance learning since last year, so over a year. We really want to get them engaged in the arts, um, get them involved, and kind of start promoting this at the new school year. So once they're back in school in person, to have this be something fun that they can do and we are expecting this to be our first in-person public um, ACC event. So we hope to do it downtown, to bring people out, to have this awards um, or art show and do an award. Um, and this one also is public engagement. Next slide. The last one is to revitalize downtown um, by incorporating art and culture. So for this one, there have been a lot of ideas, a lot of excitement. Um, we hope to have a lot of momentum for years to come. Uh, the first picture down at the bottom you can see is a mural that was recently done um, at the Neon Exchange or just behind. Um, and it was all community volunteers, which is awesome. So we would hope to kind of have some more of this going on where it's community, um, the community can come together, can volunteer their time to do these murals throughout downtown. Um, some of the other ones, the next one over is actually a, a rendering from a 2007 downtown revitalization plan. So it's kind of interesting. I just put it there also. Um, and one below is another town, um, downtown idea of just adding color and how much it can change and make um, a space just really vibrant, unique, fun. Um, one of the other ideas was to do 
um, to have a Hispanic heritage district. I don't know how we could go about doing that, but even for a portion of downtown and honoring the culture of Gilroy. Um, and since it's El Camino Real, it kind of is fitting. We can do a theme around that with, you know, the, the flags and or the banners strung across it just makes it a unique space, unlike our neighboring towns. So that was our, our idea for downtown was to hopefully add just a ton of art and culture, vibrancy, fun, unique, a place where people will travel to, even for just a social media picture. I mean, <laughs> that's important to peop people as well. Um, next slide. So lastly, um, you know, arts and culture enhances all of our lives. Um, our goal for our commission is to um, basically integrate arts and culture into the planning of our city. So if it's street lights that need to be replaced, benches, sidewalks, really anything, we can take an artistic approach, have an artistic eye, just change it up so that it keeps growing the art and the culture within the city can continue to grow in just, you know, in incremental value that over time will be just really um, vital to our city, to growing it, the economic impact, the unity, um, just creating a space that people want to be in and are proud to be in. So that's it for, yeah, Arts and Culture Commission. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, does anyone have uh, any any questions uh, after that wonderful presentation? Okay, thank you, Melanie. That was wonderful. You're welcome. Very, very, very nice to hear. Thank you. I know, money. <laughs> was one All of right. them too. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, council, that moves us on to interview of Parks and Recreation Commission applicants. We have three tonight. One person has bowed out. So we have Tony Cisneros, which I, who I see, uh, Nicole Martinez, I see, and Efren Pineda. Is Efren here? There he is, okay. And I want to acknowledge that council member Tovar is here. He was having uh, trouble getting online when we took attendance, but, but he is here. I just haven't said that yet. Hi, Fred. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, we'll move right into these uh, interviews, and I think how I'm going to uh, do this is ask one general question of all three of you, and that's going to be, you know, what, why, why are you the best? You know, we have to just somehow get this. Why do you think you're the best of the three of you applying for this position? Uh, and uh, what, what, um, what do you plan? What is the main thing you'd like to accomplish from the position? And then we'll go to council members and see if there's a, if we can narrow down to a single question from council members two to do to the three. All right. So taking you all in alphabetical order, that would be uh, Tony, you're first. Uh, why? Welcome okay. and thank you for applying and let us know a little bit about why you think you're the best person for this seat and what you, the main thing you hope to accomplish. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, again, uh, my name is Tony Cisneros, and I guess I was a part of my education. Obviously, I have a Bachelor of Science uh, degree in Business Administration with a minor in Information Technology. I, I worked for Hilla Packard as, uh, as an engineer, and later I moved into what they call Business Development Manager for part of the U.S. and Latin America. Uh, that that part of the business took me into uh, working with a lot of uh, people, governments, um, uh, to, uh, not just in in uh, Latin America, but also in the U.S. and sometimes even in Europe. The um, to to go right into it, uh, my family um, has been living here at least my my oldest daughter for over thirty years, and and um, and all of my uh, children four out of the five followed her to Peel Roy because of the city. Uh, it's a very nice community. And I followed them because I was always here uh, taking care of the grandchildren. I have 13 grandchildren uh, here in Gilroy. And those uh, grandchildren, obviously, they attend the uh, school system. And and uh, one of my grandsons is, um, is a teacher 
in the city of Gilroy. My, uh, my daughter-in-law, she's also a, a, a teacher here in the city of Gilroy, and my son is a high school teacher. But I'll make a long story short, yeah. um, they all use the park system. Uh, I use it, you know, the trails. I think the city of Gilroy has done, has done a great job. But one of the things that I would like to be able to bring back if it's not in the planning stages. Before the pandemic, we used to have uh, the um, basketball, soccer, uh, baseball uh, games, uh, which all got, uh, shall we say, um, st uh, stalled because of the uh, pandemic. But I like to see those uh, come back. But like I was asking my son one day, how come um, the um, my uh, my daughter who went into sixth grade can no longer play basketball. She was able, she was in the teams playing basketball uh, uh, up until the fifth grade. And he said, that he said, the problem is that after the fifth grade, there are no teams as part of the, uh, of, of the recreation department. And I said, why? He said, because it is assumed that after the fifth grade, the middle schools and the high schools will uh, take over in terms of the varsity. I said, yeah, but only Tony, very I'm, I'm sorry, it's a three minute limit. You've got about oh. 20 seconds left if you wanna oh. wrap because we need to get okay. through everybody. We have a whole meeting, yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. my main angle would be to introduce the, um, all of those uh, different sports and activities to all the kids between the ages of uh, kindergarten all the way through high school. Great, thank, thank you very much. Okay, um, so uh, Nicole Martinez, the same question to you. Why would you think you're the best person for this position and what would be your main goal to accomplish? Good evening, everyone. Um, um, I think I may be the best uh, person for this position. I am a, um, a representation, representation of, of um, the community, an avid park user with uh, two young children of my own uh, wanting to explore um, other spaces other than our backyard. <laughs> um, I have a real passion for community, having a, a background in, in public health. Um, um, uh, I'm an effective communicator and um, an excellent written and verbal communication skills. So I uh, listen, um, I would listen to um, the needs of those who are um, using our parks, using our trails, what can be done to um, improve and make them more accessible um, and equitably um, accessible to, to our community members. Um, what I want to accomplish, um, um, can really connect myself with the community and, and, help, and figure out ways to um, improve the health and wellness um, to, and how our parks contribute to health and wellness um, of our community members. Um, I wanna uh, broaden my knowledge um, of the community in which I live. Um, I am not a lifelong Gilroy resident. I'm actually um, a San Jose native, uh, but did uh, move here with my husband about, oh, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, wow. Um, and um, really fell in love with the community. Um, and again, as a regular park user, I would like to become more involved in projects that enhance the accessibility, sustainability and usability of parks in, in our community. All right, thank you very much. No Efren, same, same question to you. Would you like me to repeat it? Uh, sure. Okay, the question is, why do you think you're the best fit, the best of the applicants for this position and what would be your primary goal to accomplish? Okay, um, first I just wanna say good evening to everybody. I hope everyone's having a great Monday. Um, the reason I'm, I believe I'm the best person for this job would be I am intertwined with local clubs within the community, uh, basketball, soccer, football. Um, I'm very aware of everything going around from uh, baseball to, to coaches doing side trainings to everybody within our parks, right? Um, but what you don't see a lot is a lot of our youth at these parks. You see a lot of parents with children, but there's a lack of opportunities for people to attend at something that is put on by the community. And I believe my end goal would be to create a, a pathway for children to play in sports and attend their local parks, right? To bring kids back out to the fields, to bring kids out back to the basketball courts, right? Instead of being inside and playing video games all day. But the issue is we don't have a 
big enough group or a big enough uh, representation from our youth, meaning people my age within their 20s, 25s, 30s, right, that, that, are, that want to bring these kids out there, right? They're working full-time jobs. They're, they're doing other stuff that keeps them away from being involved, right? And I think that's why I'm the perfect candidate because I'm connected with all these activities and I feel like I have great ideas coming to me that I can help out the community with, with the help of Parks and Recs, right? Uh, being allowed to set up events for not only kids, but also adults, because adults also want to stay locally and not be like, hey, did you hear about this in Morgan Hill? Hey, did you hear about that in San Jose? I want to create an environment where everybody has a place in Parks and Rec. And my end goal would be to get everybody excited to, hey, look, there's a there's a 5K going on from Christopher High School all the way to Gavilan College or something like that. And that's my end goal, to get everybody back and excited out to be involved in their community. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Is, uh, council, does someone uh, have a, another burning question to go around to with everybody? No? Wow. Okay. I, I'm not actually seeing all council members. So if shout out if I'm not seeing you. Mayor, can it's. Okay. Yes, Fred. Hi, uh, if, if I may. Yes, you have a question for them? Yeah, yeah thank you all. And I just have questions for all of you. I appreciate your, uh, your willingness to step up and really um, you know, um, go out there and make a difference in jewelry. Right. Thank you for um, your, your resumes and for everything you, you mentioned. But for each of you, um, just hearing sort of what your, your, your goals are, maybe you can tell me in your own opinion what you think some of the issues we have regarding our parks and recreation and what would you recommend to sort of fix those? Wait, what, what are the issues within parks and rec and what would they recommend to fix those? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Tony, do you want to try to tackle that in two minutes? Well, just, uh, just one of them. Uh, and that basically what is my main goal would be to, uh, that what I had noticed that after the fifth grade, uh, the uh, soccer, basketball, and, and baseball activities were not open to the kids beyond once they enter middle school. And I think it's, if you think about it, that's the age after when you go into middle school and high school, when you need more activities to keep you busy. And, and, and when I asked my son that question, why don't I, why don't I see it? That was his answer because he's a coach. He coaches in the soccer league and baseball league and they all, they're all volunteers, by the way. And that's what he said. He said, they don't exist because it's assumed that the middle school and the high school will take it. Well, I like to open all those activities. We already have the curriculum. We have the, uh, the I guess the basis for doing it. Uh, so why not just add the, the, the high school kids and the middle school kids to be able to join those activities and the leagues. That's the part that I think where we fell a little bit short and that would be to our teenage kids. Okay, thank you. Nicole, you wanna give that a try? Um, sure. Um, what are the issues and recommendations to fix all? Um, I think um, access and awareness um, has been um, a real a hindrance for a lot of our community members in um, improving health and um, getting outside and um, leaving our homes from which we've been stuck in for almost a year, over a year, excuse me. Um, I had one experience long ago, probably four or five years ago, I was walking through uh, my neighborhood and I found um, on somebody's front yard uh, this tree, this really small tree, and on it was a rope, and it was fashioned into a swing with a towel, and I thought to myself, these poor kids, either their parents don't let them walk to the park that's uh, just, you know, a mile away, or they don't know about their parks, and um, they're using this sad little swing to, to, <laughs> to swing on at home. So I just, I really think that um, um, making our community aware of, you know, the wonderful parks and, and, and activities that our, our city provides um, to them. 
Okay, thank you. Efren? So I think one of the biggest issues with our parks and recs is, you know, like Nicole said, the awareness of it. Uh, not many of the community knows where their local parks are at, or some of the new people that move into Gilroy don't know that the levee goes all the way down to the end. They only think it's a one mile stretch, right? Um, but I think another thing for like recreational events, not a lot of people are aware of them. Um, I mean, they go out in a couple brochures, everything's word of mouth or shared. But I think the biggest solution here would be getting everybody excited and energized, you know, to get to get into those parks. I mean, every park consists of like a swing set and something for children, right? Um, maybe here and there set up, you know, a little uh, cornhole there to get somebody, their family to go to, or, you know, have like a park weekend right or create create as um the art the art director said you know create maybe like a weekend a weekend draw at the park day and get involved with everybody to create more of these events that you're doing locally so it 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 it, it keeps saying in their mind hey remember when we went to the park and we did this and you know it was a fun time maybe we can do it on our own and you know create events that are long lasting for people to keep getting involved and not just be home and I think that's that's that will solve some of the bigger issues, right? Being being involved as a community, being aware of like where to go as well, right? Because the two, the people know three of the big major parks here in Gilroy, which is Los Animas, Christmas Hill, and then the sports parks, but they're not aware of of the smaller parks within within their little area. And I think if if little events were to pop up, like a like the bike ride, if you connect it through the little parks, having little water water stations there people be like oh I didn't know there was a park here you know maybe we can have a picnic here and stuff like that I think that would solve a lot of the issues with awareness and stuff or also like on the maps uh, she had a your two minutes so just okay that's, okay. that's fine ahead, just that's okay wrap it up okay <laughs> yeah that's fine that's... Oh, okay all right okay thank thank you all very much I think you all know that uh we're going to be um uh, finalizing this right this meeting so under agenda 10 C so uh, hopefully you're sticking around um, go do something fun in between because it could be a while but it is going to be tonight that we make a decision so the best part is that we have applicants we cannot thank you all enough for being willing to apply that is that is just really where it all is so thank you all very much okay uh, with that, I am going to move into reports of council members uh, and start with uh, council member Bracco. Um, all I have to report is I would like to uh, give a pray out to our police department. Um, in my business, we work with about 10 different law enforcement agencies. And uh, last week I had the opportunity to respond on an accident over on Mayock. And I gotta tell you, our police officers are true professionals and they're very impressive at how good they do their job. And I would just like to send that out to our police department. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Armendariz. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, the Downtown Business Association had an alley cleanup that I was able to participate in on Saturday. Um, it wasn't fun because we were sweeping and getting full of dust and leaves, but it was fun because there was a lot of uh, community members involved and uh, local business owners. And so that was, um, it was a nice event and the alley looked great. It looked really good. It cleaned up a lot of leaves and dirt and trash. Um, let's see. Historic Heritage is meeting next week. So I'll report back on that then. And, um, oh, I forgot to mention last, last meeting is uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So I wanted to recognize that and the contributions of our uh, citizens who are of that community. Thank you. All right, thank you. Council Member Marks. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I want to remind everyone that the GDBA is doing a preview of Gourmet Alley on June 19th from three o'clock to nine o'clock between 4th and 5th Street. 
Um, I would have been there helping to clean up too with, with Rebecca, but I was babysitting <laughs> all morning and we had a meeting at eight o'clock on another issue, but um, it looked, it does look wonderful. I walked through it on Sunday. So if you want to get a preview of Gourmet Alley and the future plans, please plan on coming out on the 19th. They're going to have music, food, and drinks. The ad hoc committee for the unhoused uh, we met last week. I just want to remind everyone that our minutes and our agenda are posted on a regular basis these last few months after um, it was requested to have them posted. Um, uh, Councilmember Brockway and myself went up to visit City Team last week in San Jose. It was a very impressive operation that they have. Not only do they deal with uh, the unhoused who um, have mental illness or drug addiction problems, but they have a nice job placement uh, and job training program. We got a tour of the facility. Uh, they run it as uh, people who have addiction. They walk in, they can stay uh, however long they want to stay and they're free to come in, you know, and to leave. And then they have to come back and re-enter the program if they so desire. Uh, the person who is in charge said they have an 85% success rate with the people who go through the program. We were very excited about it. I left though feeling very disappointed because we had high hopes that this was going to be our group, our service agency that was going to come down to Gilroy because they had told someone they were interested in opening a facility in South County. And uh, they just recently purchased a 50 unit apartment complex for women and children. And so their finances have dried up at the moment, but um, I am still hoping that maybe when things get better, they will come back down to South County and look about establishing a program here in Gilroy or even Morgan Hill. Um, this next week, I'm going to meet with a person who works with a job training program here in Gilroy. Uh, she's going to give me all the details that I'm going to share with you at the next meeting. Uh, she is very disappointed at the moment because no one's taking her up on or taking her business up on the offer of this job training. And I think the only reason why they're not is because they don't know about it. And I left the name on um, my other computer. I don't know that much about it because I don't know the name. So anyway, I think that's part of the problem. But I just want to let the public know that the ad hoc committee is committed to funding programs that show success in getting the unhoused back on their feet. All right, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor Blankley. Um, so I have an update from the Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board approves contracts for 177 megawatts of clean energy. The Board of Directors approved two 15-year renewable power contracts for solar and battery storage and wind energy. Battery storage continues to be a priority as we aim to support local and state climate goals that require a reliable grid all hours of the day. Wind energy complements solar as wind ramps up energy, excuse me, wind ramps up generation in the evening after sunset, strengthening the power of the mix. The projects are set to begin delivering energy in 2023 and will account for about 12.5% of Silicon Valley Clean Energy's electric load. With this contract, SBCE's electric supply will continue to be 100% carbon free with approximately 60% of its power in 2024 coming from renewable sources. Community resilience funding has been extended. Silicon Valley Clean Energy has extended the timeline for communities to apply for funding to support projects that help member agencies reduce the likelihood of power outages, minimum impacts when outages happen, and support local job creation. Funding is available for regional and jurisdiction planning activities and for capital and for project capital. Community resilience projects have the capability to help with economic recovery, decarbonization, and grid flexibility. Silicon Valley Clean Energy is, a, is in direct contact, contact with member agency staff about this opportunity. And lastly, the EV Smart Charging Pilot expanded to full-scale program. This is a, from GridShift. EV Charging is a smart, char, smart changing program that allows users to plug in their EV and set it and forget it while the app optimizes for cost and carbon intensity on the grid. The GridShift app was a pilot program, pilot program selected from the fall 2019 innovation on-ramp cycle and resulted in $5,000 in savings for the 75 participating vehicles. 
The expansion of this program will allow all Silicon Valley clean energy customers free access to this app to manage their EV charging to save money and carbon. The program also assists Silicon Valley clean energy with managing load from EV chargers, which helps reduce the grid congestion and may support the state's effort to energy for energy conservation during flex alerts. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Tovar. No report, Mayor. All right, Council Member Laromanos. Just very briefly, the GEDC met last week. Um, one of the items that we heard about from uh, Jane Howard was with regard to just how far behind the state of California is in, re in regards to its tourism dollars. That's a big part of uh, income to the state as a whole and certainly to our city as well. Uh, so Jane's uh, plea to all of us is to make sure that we talk with our respective communities and remind people there are a great many places without, within our state that people can go to enjoy their time off this summer. Uh, so please do consider that uh, because our state really is lagging compared to some of the other states in our region. So please do take advantage of vacation opportunities in the Golden State. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And my report, I've got three things. Um, one is um, last Thursday, um, AB 1091 from uh, Assemblymember Mark Berman uh, was put on hold. So that is, I, I would like everybody to know, uh, because that had to do with BTA board governance. And um, Mark is trying, Senator Assemblymember Berman, is trying to start a discussion on how to improve VTA's governance. And um, in all the discussions I've had with him personally, um, he has never said that he thinks he's got the perfect model going. And so AB 1091 uh, was just his effort to get started. And uh, I don't know how far he intended it to go, but he issued a press release last Thursday that uh, retracted it completely for now, putting it on hold. So uh, I'm letting my council know that I do support looking at um, a different governance for the BTA board, but um, something that still makes sure that Gilroy and Morgan Hill have a voice. This one didn't do that. This one gave us two chances at having a voice, but we could have gotten neither of them. So um, it's just a difficult thing, but I'm glad that the discussion is, is beginning because I think it does need to be addressed. Uh, that was the first item. The second one is on BTA's transit-oriented development. Um, tomorrow, I've got a meeting with BTA, the people directly involved with this development. Um, I will be speaking on this item at the uh, Accounting and uh, Audit and Finance Committee meeting, I mean, on Thursday. Um, they are moving forward with um, their design. Uh, well, not moving forward with their design. They want to go for the, get the RFP going. And so it has to go through ANF first, which is audit and finance, and then it will move on to the board uh, for the RFP. Then whatever comes back, you know, the responses they get from the RFP is what's going to help start to mold what this thing is going to look like. Um, lastly, uh, June 9th, and this is uh, the mobility partnership that I sit on with Council Member LaRoman Yost, uh, they are going to start some serious public outreach for the Highway 101-25 interchange. So everybody get ready to start hearing about exactly what that is going to look like and the timeline for construction. June 9th is when they'll begin their outreach. And then you're going to see a whole series of things. Like I know they're already scheduled to speak before our Rotary Club as well. Okay, that is my report. Uh, next is future council initiated agenda items. Uh, does anyone have anything they wish to raise at this time? Mayor, um, we, uh, we had moved item 10A after interviews, just a reminder. Um, no, we moved until after consent. Oh, okay, my apologies. That's okay, that's okay. All right, um, future council initiated items, moving on. Okay, so consent calendar. And there's a couple things I wanna point out here on consent before we uh, get a motion or before anybody pulls anything off consent. And that is a correction to be stated for the record per Andy um, on item C in our consent calendar, the first line should read C period, property improvement agreement number 2021-01, approval of the final map 
property improvement right of way dedications by separate documents and easement dedications by separate documents for Hoey Ranch Development Tract 10495, APNs 7830-4023, 7830-4026, portion, and 7830-4028 portion. With that being said, um, do I have, uh, I think I need to ask for, do I ask for, yeah, public comment on anything in consent? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Seeing none. Okay. Um, approval. Okay, that was Council Member Tovar to approve. Second. Second by Council Member Laroman Yost to approve the set consent calendar. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Armandaris? Aye. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Lara Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. Okay, so now we are moving up item 10A. And this is um, City Council position on Senate Bill 612, uh, Portentino, a rate payer equity bill. And I know, I think we have Trevin Barber with a staff report. And then we also have Malisha Charles, am I spelling that, uh, saying that right? From South Valley Clean Energy here to uh, speak or answer any questions. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Trevin Barber, Senior Management Analyst with the Public Works Department. Before you tonight is a staff report and letter of support for Senate Bill 612, a ratepayer equity bill for your consideration. Here from Silicon Valley Clean Energy is Militia Charles, who will provide a brief presentation on this bill. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Militia Charles, you can call, also call me now. Okay. Nice <laughs> to see everyone. I have a, <laughs> no worries, it happens all the time. Um, I have a couple of slides to share. I don't know. If the clerk is going to put them up, or do I need to share my screen? Yes, just share your screen. Um... Okay, perfect. I will go ahead and do that. Can you guys see? No. Let me try again. Here we go. There we go. Yes. I assume you can see it now. See okay, it now. so this is. Great. This is related to a fee that Gilroy Electricity Customer State called the PCIA. And what the PCIA is, it's a fee that um, all CCA customers, uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy is a CCA, an electricity provider, pay um, on to pay for uh, electricity that was purchased on the behalf by PG&E prior to leaving pg e and going to a CCA like Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Uh, our biggest concern about the PCIA is that it um, has increased over 900% since 2013. Let me put this in. There we go. Since 2013. And um, while CCA customers pay for the cost, there's certain benefits uh, attached to the energy that was uh, purchased on their behalf. So the benefits relate to clean energy and solar. The benefits relate to reliability and keeping the lights on. And those benefits, if, were, if they were allocated to um, CCA customers would help reduce the PCIA and allow um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy and other CCAs not to uh, purchase additional electricity when it's not needed. So what SB 612 does is it does a couple of things. It provides fair and equal access to those benefits of the leg legacy resource for CCAs and also direct access providers, and it reduces costs for all rate payers. So specifically what it does is it provides utilities, CCAs, and direct access customers equal white to buy legacy resource credits. And it requires the California Public Utilities Commission, which regulates the investor owned utilities, to recognize the value of greenhouse gas free energy in the same way it does for other um, renewable energy and other um, products and attributes associated with its electricity. 
So I only have three minutes. This is not the easiest bill to communicate in three minutes. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but the bottom line is we're asking for your support for this bill because we do think it's important for Gilroy Electricity customers to be paying reasonable rates and making sure those rates don't continue to increase over time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And yes, council members, any, any questions to uh, help us support this? Can you remove your screen? That way I can, I'll see everybody and make sure that. Uh, oh, yes. I'll stop yeah. sharing. <laughs> That's a, yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. Are there any questions or, okay. I see council member Marks has her hand raised. Oh, no, but you're on mute, Carol. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe just for all the citizens, even myself, in plain English, is this mm -hmm. going to reduce our PG&E bill? You know, how could you say that in the, you know, the simplest language? I know this is so, it's so hard to say. <laughs> it will reduce your electricity bill because it, it's related to electricity. So it will reduce, it will help reduce that because Basically, the PCIA has a complicated calculation. There are the costs, which I just talked about, but then there are also benefits. And so the costs are the plus side of it, but any benefits also decrease basically the cost. And that PCIA is a fee that's in the bill, so that would be reduced. That's one way. Another way is if um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy had more access to these benefits, then when we purchase electricity, we don't have to purchase as much to meet certain mandates and goals. So again, it's not, we're not doing double duty in terms of, you know, trying to purchase something to meet the mandates and goals. We can also um, use this to meet the mandates and goals in a way that makes sure that our, our electricity portfolio is optimized. I know that's not plain English, but no, no, you know, it, it makes that will help. And if this bill passed, how soon would we start to see results? Uh, that's a good question. So it would have to be implemented if it was passed. Hopefully mm -hmm. it would be by next year because, you know, oh. it would be passed okay. this year. But there is a process that would have to go through the PUC, so it may be a little bit longer. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Council, any other questions? All right, you see the letter of, of support in our packet. Um, do I have a motion to approve it? So motion. Second. Okay, I heard I'll Council second. Member Munoz, was it? Uh, Council Member Armendaris, did you have a second or do I go with Mark? Sure. Okay, so uh, Council Member Leroy Munoz made the, uh, uh, made the motion. Council Member Armendaris seconded the motion to approve a letter of support for Senate Bill 612. Uh, roll call, please. Before roll call, should we move to public comment? Oh, my apologies. Yes, we should. Thank okay. you, Christina. No worries. Um, if you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand now. Seeing none. Okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead and do roll call. Council member Armandaris? Yes. Council member Bracco? Yeah, yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Lero Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. All right. That passes unanimously. Okay. Now we're on item 7A bids and proposals. First Amendment to the Agreement for Services with CSG Consultants Incorporated for continued on call building and fire prevention plan check and inspection services until July 15th, 2021. I believe Robert Carrera is here to give us this report. Yes, I am. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Robert Carrera, Management Analyst with the Community Development Department. I'll be giving this report on the First Amendment to the Agreement for Services with CSG, CSG Consultants to uh, number one, extend their agreement until July 15th of this year and number two to increase their contract capacity to a total of $922,766. So the city's building and building division and fire prevention division, they rely on the usage of consultants to assist both with the volume and the technical knowledge of 
plan check and inspection services for the community development department. Our current slate of consultants was in this category was approved in 2018 and that included CSG consultants, which received the largest uh, largest contract out of the a batch of consultants. And the reason why is that CSG consultants has a vast array of those resources in order to uh, provide that timely and that ex uh, that timely turnaround for plan checks and for inspection services and also the required expertise that we uh, need on occasions for a lot of large complex projects. So CSG has been a great partner uh, to the city, uh, not with just this current slate, but in uh, prior years as well. Our current slate of consultants expired on March of 2021. And it was decided among staff that uh, due to our uh, expending of the contract capacity so quickly with these consultants, quicker than we anticipated, we felt that it was prudent that we go out and conduct another our request for proposals to replenish and reevaluate our uh, consultant services for on-call billing and fire plan check and inspection services. The city issued uh, that RFP on May 7th with proposals due on June 3rd. And the goal is to uh, bring forward those recommendations from that RFP to council on July 1st. In the interim period, we're looking to keep our current slate of consultants to fill in the gap between uh, the expiration date and all the way up to uh, when we would start these new slate of consultants. Uh, this contract amendment, this is, we are not asking for a budget amendment. We are simply asking to increase the contract capacity so that we can be able to continue to utilize CSG consultants in this interim period uh, until we bring in that new slate of consultants. As stated in the, uh, but in the uh, staff report to as of May 6, 41% of the billing division's uh, contractual services budget has been utilized. So we don't feel the need to uh, uh, issue a budget amendment for that line item. Uh, and then again, uh, as you know, plan uh, plan reviews and permits, those are generated through fees. So this contract is paid through for fees. So if there's no fees coming in, no revenue from plan check and permitting activity, on the other end, there won't be uh, expenditure activity from our consultants as a result. So those, so the fees are meant to offset these results. So in conclusion, we our staff is recommending that council approve this amendment as presented. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions as well as uh, Community Development Director Karen Dar Gardner as well. Okay, thank you, Robert. All right, council, any questions? I am looking for hands, seeing none. All right, um, is there any public comment on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. All right, thank you. Uh, back to council. If there are no questions, uh, is there a motion then? Where are you guys? I'll move, I'll move approval of the um, amendment. I'll second. Okay, so we have uh, a motion to approve by Council Member Leromagno, seconded by Council Member Bracco, an amendment with CSG Consultants Inc. to extend their agreement until July 15th, 2021, and increasing their contract capacity by 59,178 to a total of 922,766 for on call building and fire prevention plan check and, and inspection services. Roll call. 
Council Member Armandaris? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Council Member Hilton? Aye. Yeah. Council Member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blake? Yes. All right, that passed unanimously. All right, item 8A, uh, public hearings. All right, now this is, um, we're going to, I'm gonna read what this is. We're gonna to go to public comment, but then this item is going to be continued to June 7th um, due to a publishing noticing error. So this is conduct of a TEFRA public hearing and approval of the issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds by the California Municipal Finance Authority for an affordable housing project located at 1520 Hecker Pass Highway. Uh, again, there's no staff report here. Um, for whatever reason, there was a mishap in noticing with the dispatch. It will be, so we have to wait now and continue it to June 7th. So I'm gonna open the public hearing in the event that anyone does wish to speak tonight, but the public hearing will also be open on June 7th. So Christina, is there anybody here who would like to speak on this item? Yes, we have Stephanie L. Um, you may speak. Hi, my name is Stephanie Ely. I am a resident here of Gilroy and please thank you for your patience as I am new to uh, meetings like this. Is there an environmental impact report on this? And if so, where is it posted? Is it required? Okay, Karen, thank you. Yeah, I can answer <laughs> that question. No, there, there is not an environmental impact report Report required for the TEFRA hearing. Uh, there was environmental review as part of the actual construction project. And so Stephanie, uh, if you wanna reach out to me, if you're interested in seeing the environmental documentation for the project itself, I'm happy to give that to you. Thank okay. you, and um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Anyone else, Christina? Seeing none. Okay. Then uh, with that, the side will be uh, continued till June 7th. All right, item B, public hearing to establish a list of properties subject to the weed abatement program and adoption of a resolution authorizing the fire chief to abate the nuisance arising out of weeds, grow, out of weeds growing and refuse accumulating upon property in the city of Gilroy pursuant to section 12.51 of the Gilroy city code. Uh, Chief Wyatt, are you giving this report? Yes, ma'am. And okay. uh, and I'll also uh, include a couple other people to give a little bit more background and uh, answer your detailed questions. But uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council. Um, the weed abatement program, this is an essential service and an essential activity, particularly uh, as we get into the, fire, the wildland fire season. The city is working with the county to create a defensible space around homes and properties identified in hazardous fire areas. These areas are primarily in the hills that surround Gilroy. The goal is to create a buffer zone to keep fire away from the homes of our residents. Uh, due to the severe dry conditions that we're experiencing right now, it's brought our fire danger uh, earlier than usual. For example, the Palisades fire in Southern California has charred more than 1300 acres this was an arson induced fire, but uh, nonetheless, it resulted in the evacuation of more than a thousand residents. Uh, that's going on right now. It's only 25% contained. In South San Jose, just yesterday, they had a 10 acre fire um, uh, Sunday morning. And uh, just as a quick reminder, um, uh, we had major fires uh, last year that uh, occurred in July and August. We had the Cruz fire that burned over 15,000 acres on July 5th. And then uh, just over a month later, we had the largest, or I should say the third largest fire in the state of California ever. And that was the SEU lightning complex fire. The reason why I bring these things up is that um, the conditions are as dry uh, as we typically see in July. So, um, uh, we have a much larger push now to uh, to abate our, uh, our our weeds and uh, refuge in the uh, various uh, hills and uh, wildland areas that adjoin. 
So uh, what I'd like to do is to allow um, uh, a representative from the Santa Clara County Weed Abatement Program, Michael Schuster, to provide more details on what they provide and to answer your questions. And also second to that, I also have uh, uh, the, the city's deputy fire marshal, Jonathan Crick, that can talk about uh, some of the specific, specific things he's done and worked with in uh, preparation for the wildland season. Mr. Okay. Schuster, are you there? I am. Hi, I'm, I show up as Mo Cymru on this call, but that's because I'm using his computer in case I need to bring up anything specific. Uh, the weed abatement program is currently operating on a voluntary compliance basis. However, we do inspect properties throughout the county. Anything that is uh, privately held lands are eligible for inspection and some publicly held lands as well. The goal for us is, of course, to mitigate the fires that may happen by providing breaks around properties and in some of the larger properties through the properties. If you have a parcel that's under an acre, for instance, you would have to uh, abate the entire property. Anything an acre to five acres, you would have to provide 30 foot breaks around the property and then breaks around the buildings themselves. And then for properties larger than that, we would go for separating the parcels by using breaks into no larger than five acre parcels so that if a fire does start, we have adequate breaks provided in order to slow down the fire itself. We're currently inspecting throughout the area and that includes the South County area as well as some of the North County areas and any things that are brought to our attention and Jonathan Crick frequently brings things that are raised by citizens we get down and we inspect fairly immediately within a day or two to make sure that we're on top of it. And when necessary, if the program is on the parcel, we can order work against it. If not, we can add it to the program. And with your approval, we can, of course, then inspect it the following season. Okay. Is that concluding your report, Chief? Uh, yes, ma'am, unless there's uh, any more questions from council. Well, yeah, that's where I'm going next. Okay, council, do you have any questions of, of Chief Wyatt? Okay, I do not see any hands raised. Um, so I'm going to uh, disclosure of ex parte communications. Um, does anybody have any, any communications to disclose? Would, would, what would exactly would this mean on this? Like speaking to any of the property owners? I'm curious, does anyone know? <laughs> Andy? I think that would probably mean uh, property owners that have contacted their council member directly. Okay, got it. Okay, so I I guess I should go down the line. Um, I, I have none. Uh, council member Marks? No. Council member Bracco? No. Council member Laromanos? No. Council member Armadaris? No. Council member Tovar? None. Council member Hilton? No. Okay, so no ex parte communications. Um, Opening the public hearing, are there any public comments? Anyone who wishes to speak on this item, please press star nine or raise your hand. Seeing none. Thank you, I'll close the public hearing. Um, asking for a motion then, is there a motion to adopt a resolution? So okay. I'm going to say that was Council Member Laroman Yost, seconded by Council Member Bracco. Is that right? Or Tovar? No, Bracco's fine. Okay. So the motion was made by Council Member Laroman Yost, seconded by Council Member Bracco, to adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Gilroy authorizing the fire chief to abate the nuisance arising out of weeds growing and refuse accumulating upon property in the City of Gilroy pursuant to Section 12.51 of the Gilroy City Code. Roll call, please. Council Member Armendariz? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes, and that passes unanimously. All right, item 9A, Garlic City BMX proposal presentation. That will be a staff report by um, Jimmy and Mary Garcia, right? That's right. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. 
If you may recall, we've been in a memorandum of understanding with Garlic City BMX for almost two years now. That MOU expires uh, this month. And uh, so recently I received a proposal from uh, Miss Mary Garcia, who's here as well tonight, to describe the project that they propose. Um, we're we're going to show you what the, what the proposal is this evening, but we're not asking for any decisions or whatever. We're looking for council feedback uh, because we need to go back to Garlic City BMX and actually create an agreement and uh, figure out some of the items I'm going to talk to you about tonight. So I'm going to show you a very short presentation uh, that's based off of what I was given by Garlic City BMX. And um, I could answer any questions you may have, but I think Mary may be uh, certainly more familiar with these items and, and can give you into the details as well. Okay. All right. Okay, so we have the Garlic City BMX skills area proposal. This is a, a fancy way of calling it a pump track for those of you that may be uh, familiar with uh, these kinds of activities. It is a... Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Oh, there we go, it is stuck. Okay, uh, so the proposal is at Christmas Hill Park on the ranch side, and it is approximately 150 feet by 150 feet in area, which is about a half acre. Uh, the proposal states that GC BMX would provide the monthly maintenance, would install signage for track rules, track rules and empty trash receptacles regularly and hold minor events, uh, which they would notify the city of and, and in collaboration. The, the basic proposal of the city is that we would provide the site for them. Uh, we would assist them with delivery of dirt uh, from the Glen Loma area. As you know, they're, they're doing lots of construction there, uh, probably have a quite a bit of dirt to, uh, to, uh, to distribute, uh, provide them with a source of water to the site and then allow them to store uh, tools, uh, allow them to store tools, uh, equipment, small equipment in order for them to provide um, maintenance on the site. And then the last request is provide liability insurance to the site. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a second. Uh, as you can see here, this is the ranch site. You can see the ballpark here, the trail, uh, the road that goes back to the temporary fire station. So, and then there's the Miller barn as well. So this actually shows a couple of the old buildings that were there. Um, they were, I believe they may have been um, demolished at this point. I know they were in that process. Uh, but as you can see, the location in general is about a, a little, about a, a, an acre and a third with the actual park in it being much smaller. Um, but this is definitely on the ranch side. Um, it is land that is available. It is not being utilized for any specific purpose at this time. And so uh, that is a, that, that would be a reasonable location for an activity of this type. Uh, the other part is that it is very accessible to parking and very accessible to trails. So if kids are living in certain parts of town, they would be able to ride the, the city's trail system in, in many instances to get over there and, and to, um, to uh, utilize the facility. If you're not familiar with the pump track, um, they're actually very small footprint. Um, many communities around us have them. Uh, I've seen a few of them in Santa Cruz. Uh, and uh, so they basically uh, don't require a lot of pedaling. They require smaller bicycles and they allow uh, kids and even adults of all ages and abilities to uh, maneuver around the course at, at relatively slow speeds and work on their jumping skills and um, and such. This is not a full-fledged uh, BMX uh, flying through the air X Games type of facilities. It is certainly more a um, uh, lot tamer kind of activity uh, and uh, one that is growing in, in, very, uh, pop in much popularity uh, due to the small footprint and the avail availability of it for uh, riders of all levels. Uh, again, just another view of how it works. The the dirt we, we would get would uh, they would uh, you know form it and, and and compact it and make it into a a, a dirt track uh, uh, for 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 this use. Uh, I do want council to know that uh, the proposal is as, as I believe is a viable proposal and I think it's a reasonable proposal. But that does not mean that we're completely there on all the issues. And with any athletic facility. Uh, involves the public, involves the opportunity for injury, uh, insurance requirements need to be uh, determined, and also uh, we need to work with our pooling authority as well to see what the city's obligation would be and what perhaps would be the obligation of the BMX, uh, Garlic City BMX. 
we also need to talk about maintenance, safety, and fencing. Um, we know a lot of our nonprofits have the greatest intentions when they create these type of facilities, and sometimes they're just not able to uh, provide the level that's needed. Um, but we want to be aware of those potential challenges and have a, a plan going forward uh, in order to, uh, to make sure that the facility is maintained safely. Uh, next is we want to look at the hours of operation and ensure that we, uh, we don't create a site that is being vandalized or uh, attractive nuisance in the late evening hours and early morning hours and, 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 and that really coincides with the, the feel of Christmas Hill Park as well. And, and then last, we also wanna be very mindful of the impact to our, our park staff, our recreation staff and others who may have to have some even minor involvement. We wanna make sure that that's outlined and, and very clear. So these are some of the things that we're looking to do uh, with Garlic City BMX before we actually write a formal agreement. Um, but the next step is that we'd like to get any council feedback, any public comment on the, uh, the item. Uh, we will uh, work with our Parks and Recreation Commission for review, and then uh, staff will draft a final agreement uh, with Garlic City BMX and bring that to the city council for uh, your consideration. So uh, I, 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 that concludes my presentation. I don't know if Mary's on here yet. She was going to try to get on, but if not, I'll do She's my on. best. Oh, there I she is. Hi, Mary. Yep, and, I see um, her. And uh, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you have. That concludes. Thank you, Thank Jimmy. You. Mary, is there something you'd like to add before we just go to council questions? Uh, yeah, I have a little presentation, uh, about five or seven minutes, if that's okay. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> five or seven minutes. Um, <laughs> all right. I guess we'll... Uh, I could speed through it. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, as just given the level did, of where this is today, yeah. Okay, as Jimmy said, I'm the president of Garlic City BMX and we are a 501c3 corpor uh, corporation and we've been in existence with that uh, status since 2007. And I'd like to thank the council for considering this project. And I would like to try to convince you as to why I think that the youth of Gilroy deserve this healthy outdoor activity. Um, in my talk this evening, I'd like to give a little bit of the history of bicycle motocross or BMX as it's commonly known in the Gilroy area. And then five reasons why I believe that we need this activity. And then I would like to uh, talk about the community support that we enjoy at the present time. Mary, I, I just in the interest of time, I don't think you need to do that much convincing of those. Hist oh. I mean, you can do it if you want, but I think right. you can just start with telling us about specifically this project and Gilroy in the community. Can I, should I give the five reasons then why I feel this is necessary? Sure, okay. go ahead. The most important one, I think, is that the track will be safer than any jumps that neighborhood kids will build. Uh, for instance, the experts know that the landing on a jump needs to be three times the distance of the approach to the jump. Now the neighborhood kids don't know that. So to avoid broken collarbones and other broken bones, we have the experts that can build it. The second reason I think this is necessary in Gilroy is technology has taken over kids' time. Uh, the kids are in front of a computer all day for school or most of the day. And then after that, they're playing video games on the uh, iPad or whatever. And this will get them outside and it's a healthy outdoor activity. Uh, the third one is uh, the riders that live around Gilroy and participate in this sport right now, they have to travel to Watsonville or Santa Cruz or Aptos or San Jose to get in some time. Uh, reason number four, this is a personal reflection. My family and I were bicycle riding on the levee on the east west side of Santa Teresa, and we had some of my son's friends with us. And these two 10 year old boys that were with us wanted to take a detour. And I thought, what? Why are we taking a detour? They wanted to go to these three little bumps that some neighborhood kid had built to ride those. And I thought, you know what, th th we need this. And then I asked my two of my grandkids, his, excuse me, they ride bikes. I said, do you want a pump track in Gilroy? They live about 20 minutes away. And if you do, why? 
So Isabella, the 13 year old said, well, it's more fun than riding on flat surfaces and we get exercise. We love to ride our bike. So I thought, you know what, we really do need this. And then number five, visitors will come from surrounding areas and they will visit our restaurants and our gas stations. And so this will help our economy also. And like Jimmy mentioned, we can have annual events. Uh, we can teach bike skills, bike safety, uh, healthy living, all of the good things that come along with bicycle riding. And then uh, one more thing recently, uh, well, after we got the MOU from the city council in 2019, we quickly put together a fundraiser out at uh, Hecker Pass Winery. We had a spaghetti uh, dinner and we raised over $5,000 that evening. We had 75 people in attendance. We had many businesses support us, Taco Bell, Sunshine Bikes, Shifty Bikes. We had Cycle Center. We had Cali Helmets in Morgan Hill, Fox, Habing Family, Family Funeral Home and more. And we already have volunteers pledging their time and their services pro bono. So okay. I, I, I hope that the council realizes that this is a very beneficial, fun, safe addition to our community. And I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, I know council member Armandaris, you had your hand first, council member Mark second. And I don't know if your questions were for Jimmy because your hands were raised before Mary started speaking. So I'll go to council member Armandaris first. Thank you, mayor. And thank you, uh, Jimmy and Mary. Um, one thing I would like to, to make sure of is that uh, in our MOU is if um, Gilroy BMX is, is managing the park that we still have designated time for uh, open access and public access. Because oh, I'm sure there's, yeah, there's gonna be um, events be and things like that going on. Our intention was that it would be open just like the cement bike park is open to the kids anytime. Uh, I assume that it would go according to the hours of Christmas Hill Park, whatever those hours are. That's great to hear. Thank you, Mary. And then um, how will you provide, because you mentioned neighborhood kids, how will you provide um, outreach so that kids from all parts of the community have, um, you know, are made aware of the park and have equitable access to the park? Well, I do know that Gilroy puts out the Parks and Rec magazine uh, that tells all about the activities. I would hope we would be included in there and maybe have some summer camps maybe nine to 12 when we would, uh, you know, in the summertime teach these skills. Uh, a lot of details still need to be worked out, but I feel that we have the energy and some money to get started. Thank you, Mary. I, I feel like um, BMX, motocross, things like that are, are affordable for, for kids from all different sectors. So I, I really appreciate your proposal. Yeah, and I did want to make a little distinction. This is not BMX racing. In the 80s and 90s, we did BMX racing out on New Avenue and on Denial Avenue, but this is a more leisure type of track that the kids can ride anytime. It's not racing. We'd Thank love you. to have a BMX racetrack, but we're not there. Okay. Council <laughs> Member Marks. Hi, Mary. It's been a long time. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, good. Um, I like the idea a lot. I just have a couple of questions because sure. um, I know you're very much involved right now and there's people that say they're involved, but then after years pass, do you see that there will always be community members that will be involved in running it and maintaining it and fundraising for this? I believe so because the people that are in the sport carol are very dedicated to it. I mean, we started in 1982 and we are, even though my boys are older now and, you know, not so much involved, we are still involved. And that's what I notice is the people that, uh, you know, are in this sport are very dedicated to it. So I really don't see that as a problem. Okay. And, and right. we can, you know, we have monthly meetings and we can, we have them here at my house, but we can open them up to the public. No problem there. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I guess the city needs to consider what happens if 
community, you know, the adult supervision part of it and maintenance of it drops off, who picks up that slack? Because we wouldn't want to see it deteriorate. Also, um, how much dust is created by a, a park this size? Well, when it's built, a lot of water is used to compact it. Uh -huh. and so there is not a lot of dust. Even because after the compacting, it stays where it's minimal dust? Yeah, in fact, it's, it, the surface is very hard. Uh, okay because you know it's uh, used water in all in the layers as they're building it okay but i mean years down the lot years down the road it's still compacted enough oh yeah oh yeah and and it would be maintained also okay um, all right. yeah all right well, thank you uh -huh. council member la roman yos so Councilwoman Marks kind of got into my question, which is about the water. Jimmy, with regard to the city providing a source of water out there, what does that look like in terms of um, in terms of an effort from the city? Is there an existing well or pipe that we can draw on there? Do we have to delay new infrastructure for that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Leroy Menos. I don't think we'd have to add significant um, infrastructure because the the area is watered as it is. Um, but so I, I think that stuff is already out there. How we get it connected and all that is in the in the gritty details. But I think the main infrastructure is already there. OK, very encouraging to know. Thank you. Council member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, Mary, thank you for your efforts and your dedication to this. It's greatly appreciated by all of us. So thank you. Um, sort of in the line of the questions that have been asked, uh, Jimmy, uh, as Mary has been mentioning that um, they've been doing fundraising and volunteers, but I'm looking down the road five, 10 years from now, let's just say that uh, they are unable to sort of um, continue to raise money to help sort of um, maintain, maintain it. Do, do, do the city, do we look at possibly being liable for any potential costs um, to, to keep the sort of um, track up and running? as it should be. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tovar. I think the, the important part of this is that even though it's being operated by a nonprofit, we are responsible for doing some type of inspection, some type of analysis to make sure that it meets standards. So part of the uh, agreement, and I'm not getting too far along the line with you, Mary, but we would require an inspection by somebody outside, somebody qualified to really evaluate the safety. And I would think Garlic City BMX would want that too, because that's a that's a good box for us all to check that the experts are making sure that it's safe. If it's not, uh, we would retain the ability to shut it down. And um, that's one of those things where in that name of health and safety, we should. So uh, it's certainly on our radar. Yeah, no, and thank you for that. And, I, and my hope is that th that'll never happen. And again, I think it's it's a wonderful, it will be a wonderful asset to, to Gilroy, you know, but I just, I'm just sort of thinking down the line because the last thing we want to see happen is a beautiful uh, track turned into something that's um, not well maintained or safe. So thank you. Yeah, and you're right. We're not spring chickens anymore. My husband and I are, you know, up in age, but uh, we still are really involved, but we have younger people in the organization that are as dedicated as we are. Yeah. And we also thought we could uh, partner up with the high schools and the kids could, the seniors, I know they need volunteer hours. That could be a possibility helping us out there to maintain it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, my comments are just, I would love to see this happen. Um, my, what I'm going to wait for is that uh, the answers to that last slide that Jimmy put up, right, the things we have to address, which do um, amount to what are the city's responsibilities, liability, you know, if someone gets hurt out there, who does that fall on, mm -hmm. and uh, where can that go, hours of operation, the things that were all in that last slide, um, so those need to be worked out, all we're here to do tonight is to hear where we are today, which I think we've just done, and uh, to receive this presentation. Uh, is there any other uh, direction, Jimmy, that you need from this council? No, Mayor. Okay. All right, well, Mary, thank you. I, I certainly hope this this uh, comes to, to work out. Okay, thank All you, right? Mayor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye. All right, next uh, item B. Mm -hmm. Approval of capital improvement plan projects. 
for funding by the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017 SB1 funds. Uh, Daryl, I think you're going to give this report. Is that it? Yes, Mayor Blankley. Thank okay. you. I'm going to share my screen with you here. Okay. Oops, let me back up there. Here we go. Thank you, Mayor Blankley and Council. Uh, we're back for our annual review of our Senate Bill 1 paving project list that we have to do each year in order to uh, get the monies for our streets. And so I'm going to go through a brief uh, um, background and review with you. If you have any questions at the end, we'll be glad to entertain those. Oops, again. Um, we anticipate to generate, or this program actually anticipates to generate about, oops, $54 billion over the, uh, let me see if I can get this, there we go, over the next decade split between state and local agencies. SB1 is anticipated to provide approximately $1.5 billion per year for local streets and roads. Gilroy expects to receive a projected amount of about 998000 about a million dollars in the fiscal year 2022 for an accumulative total of $3.3 million to date for local street pavement and maintenance projects. The California Transportation Commission uh, has oversight of the SB1 monies and requires cities and counties to provide a list of proposed projects for construction every fiscal year. The CDC also requires a report on maintenance of effort and list of completed projects. In April of 2020, our council approved a resolution and a list of projects that were rolled into the fiscal year 2021 program that will be completed by this summer. Uh, the list of street segments was selected using, uh, for this issue was selected using the city's pavement management application program, which we call Street Saver. Staff also considered uh, other aspects, average daily traffic, current pavement conditioning indexes, indexes, and geographic equity when selecting streets for inclusion on this list. Fiscal year 2022 streets were selected assuming a $3.9 million in paving funds as directed by council. Uh, as you can see here, here's a uh, picture and a graphic of the different areas of town that we're going to try to tackle over this next year with different levels of treatment. A lot of slurry sills you'll see in the light green. The darker green is actually a, a pavement section going down. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to be all over the, uh, the city in different areas, as you can see here. The recommendation that we're looking for tonight is for you to adopt a resolution by our city council of the city of Gilroy approving a list of projects to be funded by the uh, Senate Bill 1, Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that council may have tonight regarding this program. Okay, thank you. All right, council. So this is the, uh, we have to go through this every year to get our SB1 money, um, you know, in order to, it, it's just a formal adoption of accepting the money. Um, so it's nothing new. It's just our, our share for this year. Does anyone have any questions for, for Daryl or for staff? Okay, seeing none for the public, this is part of, together with Measure B money, the 1.8 million that the city receives um, each year to put towards our streets, which isn't nearly enough to keep our PCI from going down. But that is, that is what we get. That's our share there. So the rest of it, we have to address in a different way. Okay, if there are no other questions from the council, then I'll go to public comments. Uh, Christina, are there any public comments on this item? Uh, yes, we have uh, phone number 408-410-1496. You may speak. Is anyone there? Phone number 408-410-1496. Please unmute yourself. We can move on. We have another person who would like okay. to speak. So okay. I'll, I'll move to the next one. Okay. You know, Christine, it's possible there. these are public speakers for the previous item because I neglected to ask for public comments. So we'll see. Okay, let's see. Joseph Galvan, you may speak. Hi, can folks hear me okay? Yes. Uh, 
I'm sorry, is this on agenda 9C or item 9C? 9C. No, we are not on 9C yet. Apologies. I'll, okay. I'll go and wait. All right. Is there anyone else who wants to speak on 9B? Okay. No. So, okay, so no speakers there. So I'll go back to council, ask for motion, then I'll go back and ask for public comment on 9A. All right, um, any, is there a motion on this item from council? Council member Bracco? Seconded by? I'll, I'll second. Council member Leroman Yost? Okay, to adopt a resolution of the city council of the city of Gilroy, adopting a list of projects for fiscal year 2021-22, to be funded by SB1, the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017. Roll call vote. Council member Armendariz? Aye. Council member Bracco? Yes. Council member Hilton? Aye. Council member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council member Marks? Yes. Council member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Okay, I'd like to go back to 9A. Uh, Christina, I'm sorry, I didn't ask for public comment. It, it was just received report, but still the public, uh, if there were comments, if anybody was here and wanted to speak, um, I should have asked for that. So I'm asking now. If you wish to speak on the BMX pump track item, please raise your hand or an, uh, press star nine to unmute yourself. Mayor, I know I got a text message from someone who wanted to speak. I don't know if he hung up or not. You might want. The last person who had the, um, their hand raised was for no phone number 408-410-1496. If you wish to speak on the BMX item, you may do so now. Okay. Uh, some things are better in person. These things didn't happen in person, <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, um, to, to the public out there, we certainly got a lot of emails. I know I did on the BMX track. Um, I hope you were happy with what you heard. I think there's general support for it. We just need to iron out those details. Okay, um, all right then, moving on to item C, 9C, which is city facilities flag flying policy. Um, staff report, Jimmy. Thank you, Ma Madam Mayor, members of the City Council at your May 3rd City Council meeting. Uh, Council approved the flying of the LGBTQ pride flag during the month of June, and it was recommended and supported by Council to return on the 17th with an official city policy for uh, how Council, how, how council uh, uh, establishes guidelines for these types of requests. Uh, the policy decision before you this evening is, uh, should the council establish guidelines for the city to approve and display of flags other than those of the city of Gilroy, state of California, or the United States of America? Uh, attached to your council packet is a, is a um, draft policy that was created uh, based on what has uh, been done in other cities and each city has their in some ways their own approach and their own reasoning for these guidelines but we felt this was a good start for council discussion of, of this policy um, it should be stated that um, the city's flag poles are not intended to uh, serve as a forum for free expression. How, however, they, a, they may be used and authorized uh, by the city council as an official statement uh, or expression of uh, council sentiments. So uh, the policy that we have here only permits the flying of flags at the, at the discretion and direction of council. And so uh, I certainly would be able to answer any questions you have about the policy. It is generally uh, very high level in order to give council the opportunity to, uh, to evaluate each situation on its merits and, uh, and, and therefore uh, leaving the ultimate decision up to the council uh, to decide how to go forward uh, uh, when they're posed with each one of these questions that may come up uh, in, in, in a request to fly the flag. So. Uh, with that, that's my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And uh, also the city attorney has been very involved in making sure that we respect free speech and other items of uh, a legal uh, nature. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, council, before I go to questions, I wanna make sure that you've all saw in your packet two things. 
Uh, one is just a, a draft of a flag flying policy that we are here to address tonight. It is not specific to any one kind of flag. This is a flag flying policy for all flags. And the resolution that um, our city attorney uh, drafted and added into the packet uh, a little later, just to make sure you are aware of both of those things in here as we go forward. Okay, so this is this is not specific to any particular flag. This is Gilroy starting a policy on commemorative flags, period, because we have not had one before. All right, Council Member Marks, I see your hand raised. Uh, yes, my question is for Andy. Andy, in the future, if the council were to deny a group um, when they asked about flying a flag, are we legally liable? Could we be sued by the group if we said no? Well, that, that's a very good question because without a policy, the answer could be yes. And that's a reason to have a policy if you're mm -hmm. gonna allow any flags to be flown because this is the same issue that we've had in the past with access to the city's website. Several years ago, we discussed this about banners on Monterey Road, when there was a thought of allowing organizations to put up banners across the road. And we advised the council that if we created a public forum, in other words, we allowed groups to put up banners without content regulation by the city, then we could not refuse other groups. In other words, we might say, all right, the Kiwanis Club can advertise a a dinner or something, but what if a group that the city really doesn't support wants to do that? Without a policy, you cannot regulate that. So the point of having the policy and the point of adopting the resolution is to say that the flag poles, uh, that fly any flags on the flagpole would be government speech. In other words, it would be an official sentiment, an official expression of sentiment of the city council of the city. Uh, and that these are not public forums so that any group that wants to have a, um, wa wants to have a, a flag flown does not have a right to do it. Any more than any group really has a right, for example, to have a proclamation read for them. The council decides what proclamations it wants. The council decides uh, what banners should fly and the council would have to decide whether or not to fly the flag of any group or organization and there would be no public right to do so, so there would not be liability. That's why it's important if we're gonna allow any flags to fly to have a policy. All right, thank you, Andy. I wish we had this in place two weeks ago because that would have been an easy decision for me. Uh, I was just very concerned at that time that we were going to be liable and I didn't wanna see the city in the position of being sued by any other group. So anyway, thank you very much for your answer. You're welcome. Okay, Council Member Armandaris, your hand is raised. Sure, um, Jimmy, I didn't see a um, any language in there about a uh, ceremony attached to the recognition of a flag or the decision to fly a flag. Can you talk more about that? Right, uh, the, the council directed staff to return with the flag flying policy. At that time, we were not uh, contemplating ceremonies or events or anything like that. So uh, that is not included. It's something that the council could discuss and deliberate and create a policy for, but the focus of this was just what goes on the flagpole. Okay, are there any other questions of council? Uh, I mean, from council? Council member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor Blankley. Um, this would be for Andy or Jimmy. H have you seen any like flag flying policies where they where they just kind of blanketly put out like whatever month it is, the 30 day period that it, you know, it just you raise it on June 1st, 9 a.m. And then it goes 30 days after that. Um, have you ever seen a policy that gets specific um, like that, where at least it provides some direction on on the, the time that it goes up? Jimmy and I are both frowning. I, I, I don't. I, I, I think the policies tend to be fairly general. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could okay. be more specific, but you know, June first, or it could be on a Sunday, or it could be a different day of the week, or there could be nobody available. It's, it's really at the council's discretion on an item like that. But um, I, I think our our thought in, in drafting this, which we did take from other cities, was to keep it at a very high level in general. Thank you. Council Member Tovar. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jimmy or Andy, um, you, you've mentioned a couple of times that um, to the, I, I see this policy as being very vague and I think others may agree with that. Um, but in regards to, you said it's in comparison with other cities, um, for example, our sister city to the north of us, I mean, how much different it is, is this policy from, from, from theirs or other cities like Hollister who also just, uh, I think passed something very similar. I'm just curious where this actually came from because you, you've mentioned a few times that it's um, mm -hmm. comparable to, to other cities. So I'm just curious where it came from. I, I got it from the city of Oregon Hill. Okay. So that's where we started. Right. Yeah. So, so the, in regards to the question that was asked earlier by council member Armandares, so you mentioned that um, for anything else other than a fly, flying policy, we would have to create another policy in general, correct? Uh, I think that could either be incorporated in this policy or incorporated in another policy. I think it depends on which really way council wants to go. Um, I, I do not think that all cities have event and ceremonial policies. I think it's just something that is dependent on each community and, and how they want to address you know, these types of requests. I, I'd like to chime in um, here because I had um, a good conversation with council member Renee Spring you know, of Morgan Hill today. And his advice was, when it comes to ceremony, keep it simple, simple, simple. He said what Morgan Hill does, and it's been for five years, is just announce the time. So Morgan Hill will put out the way Gilroy could in, or Gilroy would, in the email express, you put out the notification. It has the city's seal on. I'm looking right at Morgan Hills right here. And it tells the public the time. And he said, it, it's a 10 minute thing where whoever from the public wants to gather can gather, but the city staff just raises the flag at the time that they said, and that's it for the city. The people who are there can say or do whatever it is they want while they're there, but it's not treated as an event with speakers and podiums and things that can then require um, monitoring or possibly even God forbid, you know, police having to be around. And this is from, from Renee. And I agree with that because anything more takes away from the very purpose of what you're trying to do, which is to support the love and gathering and acceptance of the community that this flag is supposed to represent. So I am just sharing that from him. Simple, simple, simple were his repeated words, uh, 10 minute things. And there is no, uh, no uh, Morgan Hill's flag policy is what you see before you hear. I've got my own suggestions for what we can add to make it a little more clear for Gilroy. If anyone else is unhappy or thinks it's too vague, I would hope that you brought some suggestions so that we have something to work with tonight. Otherwise, this is gonna be something that doesn't get acted upon tonight and just gets moved to another council meeting. Okay, um, I see council member LaRoman Yo's hand and then back to uh, council member Armendariz for a second round. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I, I, I very much hear the logic behind the approach that Council Member um, Spring has shared with you. Um, again, the idea is that as, as a council, we would be taking a position on the flying of the flag itself and nothing beyond that. If, if people wanted to you know, organize their own ceremony independent of the city, I, I think they're they're totally welcome to follow whatever procedure that looks like. That's fine. That's that's great if they want to do that. That's fine. But as a city, really, I think the city's kind of engagement ends at the point of saying we're going to be raising a flag. They raise the flag in the course of their you know normal duties, and uh, and that that would kind of be the end of it. And if people wanted to do something additional to that, a you know, more formal ceremony or whatever. Uh, they could pursue that as as any private group would be able to do so. So I think the the proposal from Council Member Spring makes a lot of sense. I I agree with that. All right, Council Member Armendariz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so tonight I'll be proposing um, that we do have a ceremony, which the mayor and all council members who voluntarily choose to um, attend, and which city personnel will staff and prepare. I don't think that we can earnestly raise this flag or any flag in honor or in memoriam uh, in the dark or undercover. I don't think we should do it to check off a box. 
um, in honoring a flag and the community that it represents, we affirm their existence, that they belong in our city, that we are recognizing uh, in particular with this flag, the prejudice, the violence that they've been subjected to historically and recently. Um, by raising this flag proudly and publicly with the pomp and circumstance that it merits over our city's central government building, we are announcing to the LGBTQ plus community, real and actual members of our community, um, both children and adults, that they can feel safe and welcome here. And so um, I'll ask that you all support my language. I'll make that motion soon, um, that we hold the ceremony for every approved flag raising. It's a minimal cost, it's minimal effort, um, and we can participate in it voluntarily, everyone from the mayor and council, um, and again, the expenditures of the city staff and resources that it takes to coordinate um, and execute the logistics of the event will be minimal. Thank you. All right, um, Andy, I might need some help here because um, uh, on the agenda is, is to approve the, a flag flying policy. This is not specific to a particular event, a particular flag or a particular ceremony. So are we allowed to have this discussion here or is what council member Armandaris is suggesting something that we'd have to agendize and therefore postpone this item? Right, that's a Brown Act question, of course. And the, the, I think the answer is that a discussion purely of whether to have a ceremony for the LGBTQ flag that the council decided to fly would be out of order. A, discussion uh, as Councilman Ramon Doris added at the end about putting that in the policy that there should be a city ceremony for each flag that is flown, that would be appropriate, uh, an appropriate discussion as okay. part of the policy, not as a specific item. That's what I'm proposing. Flag. So I think that's, that's the Brown Act uh, resolution of this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just so everybody's clear, this is not anything specific to this coming June 1st. Okay, um, I'm gonna, okay, uh, Council Member Tovar, I'll go to you, but I wanna get to public comment too. Yeah. So I wanna make sure the public talks before council goes too, too far into this, okay. No, thank you. No, and I, I thank you to Council Member Armandaris for that. Yeah, I mean, I when we originally passed this at the last meeting, I, I was under the assumption that it was gonna be a, a uh, a celebration or e event. I, I was naive to believe that it didn't include that. And I know I've had many conversations with our city manager and uh, I appreciate all the feedback and um, that we've had back and forth. So I, again, I, I was unclear on what it meant when we passed this in regards to what was going to happen next, because I sort of think in the same line, no matter what it is, there should be a celebration, but I understand it much better now. And if uh, we need to have further discussion and by all means, but uh, just thank you for clearing things up for me and um, making me understand what, what this all entails. So that's yeah, all I want to say. I, Thank yeah. you. I, I don't think the question is about having a celebration. It's about who's doing the celebration. <laughs> just right. say it's not right. the city is not doing the celebration. It's the people, right. the people right. who wish to celebrate, celebrate. Okay. So uh, with that, I'd like to go to public comment. So Christina, can you um, start, start with public comment on this? So this is item 9C, everybody. We have Ray Muller. Um, you may speak on this item. Good evening. My name is Raymond Mueller, and I am a former co-chair of the Silicon Valley Stonewall Democrats. I've been on the Pride Board. I've been on the DeFrank Board. And uh, my husband and I have been together for 27 years. Um, Prop 8 passed on our 50, right before our 15th anniversary when we were going to get married and eliminated that opportunity for us. Um, I need you to understand that because within my lifetime, it was illegal for my husband and I actually to be a couple. None of you have experienced that, I doubt. Yet there are students in your school that do. Now, I'm not speaking just to this one event. I'm speaking in general, but since I am a gay man, that's my experience. Um, regarding this flag raising question, the city of San Jose raises a flag basically for the opening of an envelope or any other event. Um, and if you look at their policy, they're very specific and they state what organizations, what type of flags they will accept. Uh, I did send a link to that to council member Armanderas who could share it to you perhaps. Um, you will also find that they're very specific about how it's done. But in that case, a city council member sponsors 
it as an event. And I believe, although I'm not certain, that they take it out of their city council members fund for whatever small expenditures there might be. With Pride, what they do is they invite the local gay men's chorus and Silicon Valley Pride, which is the same organization that would be your Pride, to come and take a, a get a resolution handed to them or speak for just a moment, which doesn't cost a whole lot of money. And it does make it a community event. This is the first time you're going to fly any flag. And it's the gay flag, as they say. And I think that it's vital for you to make sure that this is properly represented in the public perspective. Because there are some of you I know that were concerned that now we'll have horrible people asking you to fly flags. Well, you're still gonna to get to regulate all that. But in this instance, you need to celebrate, not that it's the gay flag, but that you as an organization are now going to begin recognizing smaller components of your community that in the past have been invisible or ignored by this body. You have the opportunity today, which is the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia, to actually make a statement that you're going to start recognizing not only us, but the uh, folks who founded your community, the, the ethnic groups that, that, that were there in 200 years or 150 years ago. Um, Santa Clara, you know, that's, uh, the uh, farmers, they have an entire ceremony. So I'm, I'm, I'll stop talking here in a moment. Sorry. So, I'm sorry. My point here is I and a variety of folks in this community are very impressed with the fact that you've chosen this flag to make your stand. And we are going to be there to help you raise it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, next speaker. We have Joseph um, Galvan. You may speak. Hi, um, thank you and good evening, Mayor and Council. And um, thank you for um, speaking, Ray. Um, yeah, my name is Joseph Galvan. I'm a resident of Gilroy uh, my whole life, born and raised here. Um, I am part of the LGBTQ community. I'm the South County Outreach Coordinator for the LGBTQ Youth Space Program, which serves um, LGBTQ youth ages 13 and 25. And First of all, I'm just recognizing that we're here talking about a potential ceremony for this flag raising because there was a four to three vote for the pride flags specifically for the month of June um, that did pass. Um, don't really know where to begin at this point. Um, just want to remind folks that it seems that there's been a lot of consideration of the impact if we should do an event like this and we're using words like liability and I understand those and those are certainly things to consider. Um, but I've lived here in Gilroy my whole life here and there are plenty and there's a rich community of LGBTQ elders who have lived the majority of their whole lives here without any kind of recognition or celebration of their community here in Gilroy. And now we have this population of awesome, incredible, amazing youth that I have the opportunity to serve on a regular basis. And so there's just so much opportunity and to remind these youth that they're seen and recognized and we can finally, you know, continue with times because just reminding folks we're in 2021, Hollister and Morgan Hill already have ceremonies like this taking place in their city. <sighs> I wanna remind council and mayor of the harm and bias that we perpetuate when we make decisions against events like this. Um, I was really sad to see that this wasn't an unanimous vote um, for a flag raising ceremony in June. I wanna thank the four council members who were in support of this vote. Um, I would be really sad and disappointed if we didn't seize this opportunity to send a message to our community that um, you're seen and recognized and you are worthy of being like celebrated by your community. There's so many barriers right now between youth and their family and all of our elders in the community um, with feelings of shame and bias and homophobia, transphobia. I think we're done. 
you know, I, you know, I feel like the four to three vote kind of affirms that in my opinion. Um, I'm not really sure what more to add to you folks. I just want to remind you of the opportunity that each of you has to create a really positive impact for, you know, youth and many elders in our community, oh, it's been, it's myself been included. You're, I'm sorry, you're at your limit. Do you want to wrap up? That's pretty much it, Marie, um, okay. Mayor. Thank, but thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for your comments. They are very well taken. All right, um, any other comments? Yes, we, uh, next is uh, Frida Kogan. You may speak now. Yeah, reminding everybody of the three minute limit. It's not to cut you off. It's so that everybody has a chance to speak. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I, my name is Fred Kogan. I'm calling in um, in response to the flag writing, um, the flag racing, I'm sorry. And um, I just wanted to talk about a little bit about um, HR 5. Um, I sent a copy to some of you. This was um, a bill that was passed that basically gave rights to, um, to all sectors that were facing discrimination. It was um, a bill that was passed um, not too long ago. Um, it is 2021 and part of um, it reads that um, discrimination by state or local government on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity in employment, housing, public accommodations, or in any program activities receiving federal financial assistance violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. In many circumstances, the such discrimination also violates other constitutional rights, such as those as the liberty of privacy under the due process clause of the 14th amendment. I'm afraid that you're in a slippery slope here. If you don't approve, um, we have federal protections that are in place. They are to protect us against discriminations. If you allow other people to have flag raisings or any type of event and you do take federal funds, you are legally obligated to allow us the same um, respect for a flag raising as it would be any other flag that would raise, including the American flag. So I want you to, to really think about this before you vote tonight, because you know I know that um, uh, council member Marquez care, cares deeply about slippery slopes. And I think the slope do, um, dips both ways. If you don't allow this tonight, um, I have the, hel the head of LGBTQ online here with us tonight. She has a lot of attorneys and a lot of clout, and we're going to be out in full force if we're denied tonight. Thank you. Okay, next uh, commenter. We have Maribel Martinez. You may speak. Good evening. Buenas tardes, uh, Maribel Martinez, Office of LGBTQ Affairs. Thank you to uh, honorable mayor and city council members and staff um, for the due diligence of creating a policy to guide future actions. Um, as the court through the course of my uh, government work as a government employee, I'm responsible for often doing flag raising and more um, celebrations connected to it. And as the policy is written that will now allow if approved to have ceremonial flags I think it'd be fitting to um, also include a piece about, about the cer ceremony itself for the flag raising as part of government business. Um, again, really want to thank the staff for their diligence in providing this guidance and making it the distinction of it being um, as, the dis as the work of the council itself through their approval and perhaps including that when that approval uh, comes forth or when that recommendation for approval of flag raising comes forth, that it also be accompanied uh, with the ceremonial piece uh, if, again, the, the council chooses to adopt that. Uh, it's, it has been my experience, again, as being a government employee putting together flag raisings and the program accompanying it, that the program is often as important as it highlights the, the 
reason for why it is part of our government business. And it also allows for the diversity of viewpoints to be expressed uh, that further the message of belonging and inclusion as part of our government work and our representation of our entire community. Um, we, we often also include our nonprofit partners, again, to highlight the rich resources that are available to our community. Um, I, again, applaud you for moving forward in such a diligent manner um, and uh, underscore that as government employees, we're here also to support um, the work that's happening throughout Santa Clara County. So thank you so much for this item. Thank you. Um, before I continue, Christina, um, Andy, with the exception of this last caller, all the others were specific to, to LGBTQ. Am, am I okay in accepting those public comments or do I need to, to not since they are specific and that's not on the agenda? I, I would say that the comments we've been hearing are directed to the policy and are appropriate, even though the individual speakers may be coming from that framework and with that uh, Thanks. frame of reference, but I would say the comments are appropriate. Okay, thank you. Christina, can you tell how many spe more speakers we have? I'm just asking myself, do I need to go down from three minutes to two? We have three and then uh, Joseph Galvan just raised his hand again, so four. You mean someone who already spoke? Correct. But he, that, he can't do that, That's all, that he's already had his time limit. Okay, so then we have three. Okay, mm -hmm. right. Okay, then we'll, I'll keep with the three minutes. Okay, thank you. No problem. So, okay. Carlos Pineda, you may speak. Hello, everyone. Well, um, thank you, Mayor Blankley and all my friends in the city council. My name is Chef Carlos Pineda, and a lot of you know me from the community. I'm a, one of the well-known leaders, I think, in the community. Um, I'm born and raised here in Gilroy. Um, I sit on various boards and community committees. Um, limiting from Chamber of Commerce, Leadership Gilroy, Sunrise Rotary, Gilroy Exchange Club, Gilroy Garlic Festival, Gilroy Foundation, South County Young Professional Networking Group, El Cajon Project, Passive Gilroy Housing Advisory Committee, and the Gilroy All Office right, show off. Okay. <laughs> I'm representing many in my community. Um, I'm also a member of the LGBTQ community, and I also work at Rebecca Children's Services, where we are one of the only organizations in Gilroy and South County who proudly fly a pride flag. And I just wanna say thank you again for approving um, the flying of different types of flags, including in this policy. Um, but I'd love to see a little bit more ceremonial information added to this. Um, and again, I thank you, my friend Armandarez for being um, so accepting of all this. Um, we continue to have important debates about how to ensure that the most vulnerable and members of the LGBT community can be taken care of. It's only right for we raise the flag as a symbol of not only progress, but our continued efforts to ensure that the most vulnerable members of our LGBT community enjoy e equality as they rightfully should. Um, I'm gonna share a couple of stats real quick. 40% of the state of California youth, LGBTQ respondents seriously considered attempting suicide in the past 12 months. More than half of the transgender and non-binary youth have seriously considered suicide. 86% 80, of the LGBTQ youth said that recently politics have negatively impacted their well-being. And I say that because I also, you know, I'm an influencer for not only our community, our state, but are also worldwide. And I have thousands of followers that kind of support me and just giving back to make sure I empower people across the world um, to kind of lift the spirits of their lives. And I personally, you know, work with 1500 youth in the community yearly and I support the LGBT community and I make sure I embrace them and make sure they feel welcome. Also 15,000 families in our community, Rebecca Children's Services serves as well. And lastly, I say this because I am a member of the community of the LGBT community and I also have been a victim of abuse verbally, um, emotionally, and physically in our own community, in our own streets. And as you all know, I go to every single event if I could to support every single nonprofit and community member if I can empower them. Um, but more importantly, you never know who's on the other side of that corner ready to you know, respond negatively. So I'm just saying thank you for being at this point, creating history, um, lifelong third generation member of Gilroy. And again, I'm out here just to say thank you um, for all your guys' hard work and not only that, but let's, let's keep moving in this rightful path of creating ceremonial um, history and making this a possibility. So I thank you all. And again, I appreciate all of you. And not only, don't forget, my name is Yes Chef Carlos, living, loving, and giving you all that I can in our community. So thank you, everybody. Exactly three minutes, Carlos. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thank you.
<laughs> okay, next speaker. We have Tere. You may speak. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I appreciate this ad, um, agenda item of adopting a city uh, fa facility flag flying policy. Flag raising ceremonies, though unique to the attendees and venue hosting them, are a display of honor and support for the community and people it represents. Flags serve as a display of unity, remembrance, and hope. They are a symbol to honor the past, present, and future people of who the flag represents and the allies that support these people. Although particular flags may fly daily, annually, or in a time of designated for remembrance, the first time a flag is raised up is most always is done with a ceremony to create an understanding of the importance of the flag being raised. It also represents an important chapter of progress within that particular community organization. I believe with the first raising of the LGBTQ flag, a ceremony is most warranted. For the first time in San Mateo's history and for the second time in Redwood City's history, an LGBTQ flag was raised with their respective cities in June 2020. It was reported live online and the city councils of both cities proclaimed June as Pride Month in their communities. They're among a growing number of cities joining the annual tradition that recognizes, supports and celebrates LGBTQ community members. Community leaders said the ceremonies came at an important time in history. The city of Gilroy should follow the traditions of its sistering county cities that have embraced the acceptance and pride of their residents and community. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, we have one more, Christina, I believe. Correct. Uh, our, next, our next speaker is Erika Cisneros. You may speak. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Erica Cisneros. I am both a resident of Gilroy as well as a member of the LGBTQ community. My, uh, my work experience entails over eight years of work directly working with queer youth and young adults, queer and trans youth and young adults local to the county. Um, I'm here today to voice support for the inclusion of a piece of your flag flying policy to include the addition of an event to follow the, any flag um, that is to be raised and celebrated. When I was 13 years old, I was followed um, in my school bus by five of my fellow students from my middle school, and I was beat up because I appeared to look to them as a member of this community. At that point in time, I didn't even know what the words they were calling me meant. Years later, when I was in my role with the LGBTQ youth space, I was approached by a mother who questioned me and asked me why my community seeks to propel our ideas on young people today and why her daughter was now talking about her feelings and how she related to this community at the age of 13. To that mother, I said, when I was 13 years old and I was beat up for looking like I do, I had no one. There was no GSA at my school. There was no rainbow. There was nothing for you as a city to adopt and celebrate our community. By simply raising the flag, you're doing the bare minimum. You need to do more because visibility is so important for this community. Think about this event in the sense that if a young person or an older person who's not out and not yet comfortable with themselves sees this flag up, yeah, they're gonna feel good. But if they see that flag go up and they see you there in support and they, 10 minutes turns into maybe 30 minutes, that person might feel safer to step into that crowd. Whereas if you just raise a flag, it just, it's not enough. Visibility is, is so important, but so is access to community. And that is one of the things that Gilroy absolutely lacks for this community. There are so very little resources here for us in comparison to San Jose, and you need to do more. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, that concludes public comment. So it is back to council. Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, there's talk about motions. I have some wording that I'm going to suggest, but uh, Rebecca, if you've got something specific you've written out that, well, okay. I yeah. see 
I see Council Member Bracco's hand. Can I go to that? Or if you're going to be ready to say something specific, may I go to Council Member Bracco first? Sure. Okay. Uh, Council Member Bracco. Well, I'm, I'm not really clear on, um, it's like we're all over the place here. Um, what exactly would it entail? Would it be just the city announcing it, providing a podium, electricity? Um, I, I'm okay with that, but if we if we're asking that the city put all of it together and go out and find speakers, you know we don't we don't support the Memorial Day parade. Um, volunteers put that on. Um, I, I don't know of any other group in Gilroy that we do uh, a whole lot. Uh, so. I, I, I'm curious to know what exactly is being asked because it seems like every one of the speakers was asking something different. So um, I could support, you know, um, doing an event, um, you know, providing yeah. the podium and stuff like we would most things. Right, I think I think what you're getting at, I'm, I I know I'm getting to, to council. It's just that it goes back to what I think Council Member Leroy Munoz said earlier, and that is just from the uh, city's uh, standpoint. I, I what I heard for a lot of the callers is us to be there. Well, every council member is going to decide for themselves. You can't create a policy that requires individual council members to do a particular action, right? When this flag gets raised, I will be there. Okay, but this, that's not what uh, the flag flying policy, in my opinion, doesn't need to dictate a ceremony of the city. It should be a ceremony of the public or of an individual person that wants to put it on, not the city. The city just raises the flag and, and makes sure that that has been made known, that, that the public is aware of when the flag is going to be raised. But that's that's just how, how I see it. That's why I said I have my own thing, but we'll We'll get to that. I, 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 I don't think this is should be turned into the kind of event that that could then require not only the other flags, but then that the city is is then responsible as a city. We re, we represent the entire city, which is not necessarily the ex, you know everybody doesn't have the same expressions. Even though, like I said, I myself will be there, but that doesn't require a, a policy to say it. So um, I'm gonna go to, let's see, it was council member Armandaris, then council member Tovar. I don't know what order you guys are in. So do you wanna? Well, I have a motion. I have language Rebecca, to propose. Do you mind if, Rebecca, do you mind if I just uh, answer Dion's questions? Does he brings up some, some good questions real fast? Sure. Dion, thank you for those questions and thank you for um, your support. So originally when this passed, uh, when I proposed it, um, my understanding, and like I mentioned earlier, I've had a few conversations with our city manager because my whole, um, you know, sort of thinking about this was that there was going to be a celebration. We were going to have speakers. You know, as you know, we had a senator, we had an assembly member that, in support of it, all of this was going to be done voluntarily. I've been working with, um, you know, folks who are interested in helping out, putting something together where it wouldn't take a lot of resources from the city. The only thing I want from the city, wanted from the city is making sure it's a safe, friendly environment. You know, obviously a podium, if we need it, they're not gonna be responsible for getting speakers. They're not responsible for providing food, any of that. All of that stuff is gonna be worked on um, by volunteers and people who wanna assist, you know. But again, that was my original thinking and that's what I've shared with some folks is that what, what I envisioned where again, it wasn't gonna take a lot of financial resources from the city. But obviously, you know, we want to make sure that we have the opportunity if we need, uh, you know, a podium or a, a microphone or whatever, very minimal little stuff that that would be, we would have access to that. And again, if for some reason we felt that there might be uh, incidents or issues with people not feeling safe, then obviously we would hope that, you know, we would make it a safe place for everybody. So that's what I envision. Um, you know, and again, the Senator uh, Laird has reached out to me and, um, you know, is very interested in coming. And this, these are people who are coming to me saying, how can we help? 
what can we do? So I have not asked the city manager for anything and, um, because again, you know, he asked me for a proposal, but there isn't much that we need um, for this other than access to, again, different small little um, minor things as, you know, a podium or stuff like that. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, Councilmember Brockwell, but that's sort of what I was, that's what I envisioned. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't, if you wanna make a mo, I, there's still discussion to yeah. happen. So, okay. Councilmember. Yeah. So I'd like to make a motion now. Okay, but we'll still have discussion before there can be any vote sure. on it, okay? Sure. So I'd like to motion that we hold a ceremony for every approved flag raising upon the first raising of the said flag. The ceremony shall include voluntary participation from the mayor and council, as well as the expenditure of city staff resources to execute the logistics of the event. The event shall be coordinated by the sponsoring council member and be held on the first business day of the corresponding month. That's my motion. I'll second it. Okay, so, um... Discussion, council, wait, Fred, you, your hand, first we have Peter and then we have uh, Carol, okay? Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. So uh, first of all, let me start my comments by saying, uh, you know, Chef and, and Erika, thank you very much for your comments that, that takes a lot of courage to share that publicly. So let me just start by recognizing and thanking you for that. Um, with regard to the motion that was just put for, forward, I, I think I still need guidance here for what the limits or boundaries around the logistics might look like. I, I think an event, you know, with an undefined set of logistics could, could grow into any number of, of different areas and any number of different responsibilities. So I, I would need a little bit more clarification on that uh, before, before we vote on that. But in what I mean. Yeah, if you want to respond now, that'd be fine. Yeah, I was just going to say what I mean by coordination is the setting up of the chairs, the podium, and you know the microphone. That's what I mean by coordination. And okay. the sponsoring city council member who asks for the flag to be raised will be in charge of everything else: program, decorations, invitees. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Okay, that that's at, helpful. Yeah, thank you. At their own expense. At, at their own expense. expense. Let me let me also continue just with um, some of my other thoughts. Um, you know, last last time we talked about this, um, you know, we discussed the raising of the uh, of the pride flag, and today's discussion really is separate and distinct from that because now we're talking about a larger policy that's going to apply to any future flag raising. Um, you know, regardless, regardless of the content. And I think it's important to recognize that the public is gonna have an opportunity to be present at the, at, the, at the flag raising. The public is gonna have that opportunity to see the flag, to participate in that, in that, um, in that moment, and also to have, uh, you know, members of the council uh, to join and share their thoughts as well. So there is an opportunity for, for visibility there. My, my concern that I'm kind of wrestling with in my own mind is, um, you know, I support the raising of the pride flag. I, I proudly voted for that last time we had this uh, discussion and I'll certainly be there at the flag raising in June when we do that. My concern is what happens when it's, it's, it's a flag that, that is, is not something that I, I support and trying to be thoughtful and consistent in how we apply uh, ceremonies is, is something that I am considering here. So um, I, I'm curious to hear more from our, our other members here uh, about what that ceremony looks like. Uh, Council member Armendariz, I think you gave us some, some contours with regard to a podium, a microphone and chairs and things like that. So I think that's helpful, but I, I'm still curious to hear others thoughts on this, on this larger point. But again, I, what I'll leave people with is I really do see this as two separate issues. There's the issue of the flag uh, for the pride flag, which we proudly supported last time. And today it's a larger policy for ceremonies going forward. I think the model from Morgan Hill provides us an example of how to do that and walk that balance. Thank you, council member. Council member Marks and then council member Tovar. And then I would like to speak before it returns to council member Armendariz. I think I agree with, uh, with Peter on this. 
I am in support of the ceremonies, but people always have the right to assemble. So I don't, I, I, I don't know, I'm having a hard time expressing this. I like the idea that, you know, whoever supports, the, the council member who supports it, puts it all together and organizes it. But I also believe that maybe other groups, you know, that fly their flags can also organize what, whatever they want to do as their right to assemble. So I would like to see us stay with the flag raising policy knowing that we could still that we could still if the if any group wants to do a ceremony can do the ceremony without actually do we really have to have it in a policy form i don't know just my my thought thank you all right council member tovar thank you mayor um and thank you, uh, Councilmember Ramadaris, for that, um, that sort of that uh, motion that you made. Um, I was just hoping there might be one amendment to your to your motion in regards to you mentioned a specific date. Could we add in there or an alternate date? I mean, because sometimes um, the first day may not be the you know it, there might be another appropriate date for an event like this if it were to move forward. So all I ask if that's possible for an amendment on that. And then in regards to the other- I would accept a friendly amendment. Yeah. And then the other things, yes, as uh, um, Council Member Armadaris mentioned, um, given that I'm the one that proposed this, yes. And, and I'm willing to sort of, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a cost, obviously, um, a reasonable cost, um, you know, help fund all the necessary items that we need for this event. So again, as what's been mentioned, you know, I, I'm not looking at anything really, really big, but I'm just looking at something that people can come out if it's on a Friday or Saturday where the entire community is, has access, especially for the uh, school kids who are, may not be able to uh, attend uh, due to school, um, that on the weekend they might be able to be there because uh, they're out of school. So those are sort of the things I envisioned. And again, I'm, I'm willing to um, help sponsor this event. Thank you. Okay, Council Member LaRomanios, and then I, I do wanna to speak too, okay. Yeah, one of the things that I, I think might be a little bit of a hang up for all of us as we're thinking through this is the term ceremony in and of itself. I think that is suggesting a certain level of involvement on the part of the city that might that might be causing us some, some challenges as we think through this. Maybe the flag raising ceremony policy just simply states that the, the, the public will be notified that the flag will be raised at X time. Um, and uh, at that ceremony, there, uh, you know, there, there, there will be provided uh, the, the city podium, uh, access to electricity and a microphone or something like, and simply leave it there. Because I think if, if the word ceremony is suggesting a greater level of involvement than I think actually is, is present. So I would just ask my fellow council members to think about make, maybe making that change. Yes, that, okay, so I'm going to speak and then I'll go back to Councilmember Armadaris. That, that's exactly my sentiment, uh, Councilmember. I, I, I see it exactly like that. I'm returning to Councilmember Renee Springs saying to keep it simple. And I'm listening to all this and already all the discussion that's happened just since May 3rd is just so not simple. I too see this as two separate issues. One was what we did on May 3rd, which had three separate motions to it. And while uh, four of the council members, you know, supported raising the flag, I did not only because of this kind of thing that then comes, not because I have anything against this flag at all. Uh, it's wonderful to see flown everywhere it's flown, but because it leads to things that then uh, take away from what's supposed to be something of inclusion and belonging and all these things that all the callers said, that is all exactly true. But the more you start to make this an event, however you define ceremony, the more you are inviting others because this is, it's public. The public can come and the public means different sides. It isn't gonna be just one, one side. The, the bigger deal you make it, the more you're inviting controversy. 
And it's sad, but that's the way it is. And that's what I, I, as the mayor, am trying to keep the city as a city out of, even though, as I said, I myself will be there, will be at this. So my position is that the policy should not be referring to a ceremony or might maybe should even specifically say without regard to ceremony, but that we will absolutely notify the public, let the public know when this is happening. And so that anybody can, whatever you're talking about, whatever you're thinking of doing, whatever you want to do, any member of the public can still do, but it's not a city sponsored thing that can then cause the controversy and, you know, God forbid trouble that we then find ourselves in. Morgan Hill does not say anything about ceremony in their policy. It's kept simple. Okay, I don't know if I should go to Council Member Bracco, Council Member Armandaris first. You guys well, decide. You allowed, you told me it would be me next. So I'll fine. Take okay. Yes, I didn't know if you wanted you. him to speak first before you, that's all. That's okay. Okay. Uh, if it's a question, I'll take it. But if it's a statement, I'll wait. I don't know. Bra Council Member Bracco, do you have a question for Rebecca's motion or or not? It can wait until after. Okay. Okay. So go ahead. Yeah. So um, regarding Council Member uh, Lerone Munoz's concerns, we eliminate most of that when we create a policy. We're creating a policy that is impartial, that is fair on how, uh, what the parameters will be for approving a flag. And so uh, we protect ourselves there from lawsuits and we make the language broad enough so that it's inclusive. Um, and the other thing is that when in the language that I'm proposing, it's completely voluntary. So if there's a flag uh, being raised that you or I don't agree with, um, we always have the option to not attend, right? It's not mandating anybody to participate in anything. It's asking that minimal resources be expended from the city to support something that we are voting on supporting, a flag raising. And I, I'm not sure about the rest of you. It feels like, like you were listening, like you were hearing people, but not listening to them. The need for, for this community and for many other communities that are going to be asking for their flag to be raised, whether they be veterans, whether they be uh, gardeners, whoever they may be, when they're asking for this, they're asking for visibility, they're asking for recognition, they're asking to be seen as part of our community. And we don't do that in the dark. We don't do that in obscurity. We do it with pride and we do it with our chin up and we dedicate the resources that we need. If it brings controversy, then so be it. This, con this conversation itself is controversial. So, okay. um, and that's what we agree to when we get, uh, when we put ourselves out there to be elected, to be leaders on something is you, aren't always going to be seen as making the right decision, but you do that based on your values. And if we truly value this community and we truly value the people of our community and all their beautiful diversity, no matter if I agree with it or, or not, whatever designation they have for themselves, they, they have a right to be heard and seen in, in our community and have their flag raised with the attention and, um, and, and pomp that it deserves. Okay, thank you. Council Member Bracco. Yeah, um, I, I think what's at issue here, it sounds like most of the council is agreement on some kind of ceremony. And um, I don't believe we've ever raised the flag in the middle of the night in the dark. Um, but at first, Rebecca, you, you, what you proposed sound, sounded pretty reasonable and, and and good, and I, I, it was pretty much about what uh, Council Member Leroy Munoz uh, proposed also. But Council Member Tovar, when you amended it, it's like the city will provide something and it, it's real vague. Um, it, it's not clear what uh, our city manager is supposed to do, I don't believe, if, if there's a request by anyone to have a, have a ceremony uh, down at City Hall. Okay. Um, so I think what we need to do is we need to, to vote on a motion. We just need to, to know what the motion is. So 
was so uh, council member armandaris and it was seconded by council member hilton so the two of you need to uh, agree to this let me try to restate what your motion was uh, i mean you can say it but i mean as far as the limitations you were specifying when you say city resources you just meant a podium you meant access to a podium a microphone and was there something else chairs chairs sorry yeah, chairs, and then uh, Peter Leroy Munoz mentioned electricity, right? That's what I mean when I talk about city resources. Well, I just it needs to be specified before anybody you know can can vote. So when you said city resources, you meant podium, microphone, electricity, and chairs. Sure. Okay. Well, that it also needs to. I mean, there needs to be a staff person, right, that puts the flag on the pole and and raises the flag. Yeah, but that takes five minutes. That's not, it's a matter of if this, if this, that's what I'm saying. And when it turns into, I'm trying to point out for everybody that, you know, and council member Tovar was asking about a different date. So now it might not even be the 1st of June. It might be the 5th of June because so-and-so can't make it on the 1st of June. And that's how this becomes the not simple thing. So I'm just trying to get everybody to acknowledge what that means when you're trying to do something other than just making an announcement like Morgan Hill does and letting whoever wants to gather, gather. And of course the city is going to be accommodating, but you don't have to be specifying that it's a city event with city resources. If the city's gonna be accommodating, then we need to be specific how the city is going to be accommodating. And well, I think by outlining it in a policy, right? That's where- Right, that's, that's where, where you're gonna differ sure on, 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 on what accommodating means. So that's why so that's I'm asking where, in your motion, yeah. What you because you've, you've got a motion and it's been seconded. So the motion again, I'm repeating city resources are limited to the podium, the microphone, electricity, and now you're saying a staff person and uh, uh, am I missing anything? Seating, chairs, and chairs. seating. Okay, so I not not limited to but as broad as those. And when it comes to date, were you saying it could be any date as chosen by what who's deciding on the date? So um, we can say the event shall be coordinated by the spon sponsoring council member and may be held on the first business day of the corresponding month. So now every event has a sponsoring council member? Well, one of the council members has to make the motion, right, for the flag to be, to accept the, the flag that's being proposed. So, okay, so now we have, what if all council members want the same thing? I mean, how are you deciding who the sponsoring council member? I'm just pointing out how this is morphing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, we'd have the same question if if we had uh, if we didn't have it in the policy, right? Who's going to sponsor it? Who's going to coordinate it? Okay, so maybe Council Member Hilton, you want to chime in with since you're the seconder. Uh, do you want to keep this on a floating date, or do you want to set this as the first of the month for whatever it is the issue is? Yeah, that, that, that's why I originally asked that what other policies I've written because I mean, you could have June 1st or August 1st is a Saturday. So I think having the language with the first business day back, um, obviously we don't want to incur, you know, uh, staff time on the weekends. Uh, first business day sounds reasonable to me. Okay, so if in th this case, for example, if we were talking this year, June 1st is a Tuesday, you would expect it to be on June 1st. Correct. Okay, so not June 5th. So Council Member Tovar, are you clear? No, no. And again, if, if that's sort of the issue that people are having, then... I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't know how this vote's going to go. I'm just oh, yeah, asking for clarity right. on what is about to be voted upon because we might be going to a second... It might fail, and we might then have a second uh, a yeah. second motion. Right, no, and, and like you mentioned, I, I'm not looking for, to morph into anything bigger. I'm just trying to see what, you know, again, if, if there's an amendment in regards to, we could play with a date, but if that's the sort no, of- No, we're saying point, the first- Right, right. That's what I understood is the first of the month, unless it's on a holiday or a weekend. Right. And of course, I don't, I don't think that needs to be said. I think that-, that No, I said, happen. I specified the first business day of the month. Right. Right. And I'm, I'm, fine. I'm fine, fine with that. I'm fine okay. with that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Council Member Lerman-Yos. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, with regard to the specific language that will appear, is this going to be referred to as a ceremony? Or are we simply saying that the city will provide these resources on the first business day of the month? And I'll, I'll address that question to Council Member Armandaris. Uh, 
to what other language would you entertain council member Laurel Munoz? I, I would simply strike that from uh, any, any reference to ceremony. I would just simply say, you know, the flag will be raised on the first business day of the month and members uh, of the public will be provided or the city will provide access to a podium, microphone, electricity and chairs. No, I'll, I'll hold to my language about a ceremony. I think that if not, it's, it's we're just checking a box and it's not in the yeah. spirit of raising a flag. Right. So, uh, but Councilor Laura Munoz, for purposes of discussion, I'm with you. So that's that's why I won't I won't be supporting this motion. But we need to still put it put it to everybody. And I just want to make sure it's clear what what we are voting on. And uh, okay, so I, I think it's going to be time to call for the question. So for one last time, the the motion is, Miss uh, Councilmember Armendariz, I think you should restate it. Sure. We. Um, the city of Gary will hold a ceremony for every approved flag raising upon the first upon the first raising of the said flag. The ceremony shall include voluntary participation from the mayor and council, as well as the expenditure of city staff force resources to execute the log logistics of the event, including seating, audio, seating, audio. Uh, what else did I did I miss? Uh, what did you have? Two three. Electricity, thank you. And okay. electricity. The event shall be coordinated by the sponsoring council member and be held on the first business day of the corresponding month. Okay, so it's back to, yeah, that, that there needs to be a sponsoring council member, which could be a, a bit of friction. And also it says, it says city resources again, and it says including, but it doesn't say that that's all. So it, it could be a lot more city resources than that. Okay, Council Member Marks, you have a question on that motion? Because we need to get a vote going. You're on mute. You're muted. I know, okay, just unmuted. I don't like the beginning of that motion because it says the okay. city of Gilroy will, Rebecca, read that again. The city of Gilroy will, will hold the ceremony. We'll hold the ceremony. Can we say, all right, can we just reword it to say a ceremony will be held? So then it makes it more blanket where it's not the city of Gilroy doing it, but it it would be the group that the flag represents and and the proposing council member could also, you know, be the one in charge, but you make it a little bit more broad. Carol, she can't because it's a city policy. So it oh. wouldn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. it, you're, you're trying to, you're messing with wording. You're trying to say wording in a city policy and then say it's not a city policy. Oh, okay. Because it just okay. makes us sound responsible for this. Wait, okay, so and, but Andy, I will. Me, but I, I, I would am, vote going so that we can, if it doesn't pass, we can move on to a different motion instead of continuing to try to try to tweak it. But Andy, so go as ahead. A, as a motioner, I would like to um, to note the oh. change. Yeah, we had um, we talked about language in terms of the electricity and the seating, podium and audio. So that's the language that I will include, not. Um, city resources logistics yeah okay andy you have something I, I had just a brief comment on the issue on the wording shall include voluntary participation of the mayor and council it's a little bit of a contradiction in terms i'm worried about making it a brown act event so if we if you want to say anything about that probably should say participation of the mayor and council would be voluntary or something like that that'd be a better way to say it I will change that. Okay, I hope everybody is clear enough on what they are voting on. Uh, again, if it doesn't, if you're not clear, then you have to vote. You have to vote no. I mean, what, you know, what else can you do? And then we try again. Can you restate uh, okay, the motion again? That yeah, would be for Council Member Armand. Give me one second, please. The city of Gilroy will hold a ceremony for every approved flag raising upon the first raising of said flag. Participation from the mayor and council will be voluntary. The city will provide podium, audio, electricity, and seating. 
The event shall be coordinated by the sponsoring council member and be held on the first business day of the corresponding, corresponding month. I'm clear. Okay. Okay, I have a question. Could we make this two motions? Because, because council member Armanderas, she's talking about the ceremony, but we haven't talked about accepting a flag raising policy. Now that would make it clear because we vote on the flag raising policy, see if that passes. And then we move to her motion about the ceremony because both would go, you know, both could go together, but we're voting on them separately. That would make more sense to me. It, it, I, I have assumed that what you're voting on is wording of the policy, but that this motion does not adopt the policy because there may be other changes suggested as well. This motion is uh, for language to be included in the policy. Right. Okay. I mean, I have my own uh, suggestion written out too to include, but um, Rebecca made hers first, so I can't offer it until this one is voted on because it's on the table. She's made a motion and it's been seconded. I've been trying to get it to a, a level of clarity that people can actually vote. I, again, if the majority of the council passes it as she has worded it, then we're done. If not, I will introduce, uh, introduce mine. See, this is hard because we, but suppose we hear yours and we like hers better then we've already voted hers down. You know, it's, it's a bad situation. But I don't think the language was an unclear, it just wasn't uh, favorable to you all. No, it, it wasn't clear. It's clear now. Yeah, it's clear. And whether or not it's favorable to the majority, I can't tell. I don't know if you well, can, but I can't. <laughs> so it's like, then um, I made the motion. So if somebody else needs to call the question. Right. I, I, I'm. That's what I've been trying to do. So I'm calling the question, guys. I think we need to vote on the motion that Rebecca said. And uh, if, if you are not comfortable with a motion, this it goes without saying any motion you're not comfortable with, you shouldn't be voting for. If you're comfortable with it, you should be voting for it. Okay, so uh, I think we need a, a roll. I don't know, if Christina, if you've got that wording all written down um, so that you can do a roll call vote on what this on what this motion is. Yes. Um... Council Member Armendariz? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Um, yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member uh, Lera Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tobar? Yes. Council, uh, Mayor Blankley? No. Okay, so now how does that leave us with the, with the flag flying policy itself? Are we... Are we done, Andy, or do I need to still address? Well, I say them? my understanding is uh, Councilmember Armendariz's motion would put that language in the policy. You still have not adopted the policy, and if there are additional changes to be made, those can be suggested also. Oh, okay. Okay, so I would like to add um, at the end of the policy that no more than one commemorative flag shall be displayed for any given period. If that's a motion, I'll second it. Okay, thank you. So is there any discussion on that or can we vote on that? Maybe we'll just do it this way, piece by piece. Okay, then um, uh, Christina, can we take a roll call vote on that? Mayor, yes. I'm, Mayor, I'm sorry, before we go there, sorry. I just clarification, can you repeat that again? And I'm trying to understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I'm saying no more than one commemorative flag at a time. Got it. Okay, right. got it. No more okay. than one commemorative flag shall be displayed for any given period. So if you had a month where you uh, uh, wanted two different flags to fly, you'd have to decide which one goes for two weeks and the, however you want to do it. But there's only one commemorative flag at a time. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Wait, Council Member Bracco has his hand. Yes. Uh, my question was, if you had two requests, would you just take the one that came in first or how, how would we decide that or split the month this is all part of what the bag of can of worms we've just opened so <laughs> i, I did my best <laughs> i did my best <laughs> if it, happens. it may not ever happen so Point yeah out. that would be at the council's discretion in the future okay 
Okay, so we have a motion and a second uh, to add no more than one commemorative flag shall be displayed for any given period. Um, Christina, can we have a roll call vote, please? I think there's some public comment, Mayor. Oh, is there public comment? Wait, we already well, had public comment. We're not comment. required to take public comment on each motion. There's public comment on this item has been Yes, heard. not on each motion? No, that's not required. My apologies. Okay. That's okay. okay. <laughs> All right, Christina, can we have a vote, please? Councilmember member Yes. Council member Bracco? Yes. Council member Hilton? Yes. Council member Lira Munoz? Yes. Council member Marks? Yes. Council member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Okay, does that conclude item 9C? Uh, if there are no more amendments, then you have to adopt the policy. I'd say the one more vote. Oh. To, okay. to adopt we, the policy as amended by the two prior motions. I'll move adoption okay. of the policy as amended by the two prior motions. Second. Okay. okay, Jimmy, you have a hand up or do you need to say something before this? No? Okay, Andy, does this, and then do we need a separate motion for the resolution? Uh, actually, let, let, let's, I, I think I misstated. What we should do is the motion should be to adopt the resolution. The resolution, adopts the policy and approves the policy as it has been amended by the two prior motions. Okay, so that means I need a motion to, I need a motion for a resolution of the city council, the city of Gilroy approving a council policy regarding the display of flags at city facilities as, as we just approved? Yes. So I'll, make, I'll make that motion as stated by the, uh, the city attorney. Second. Okay. Motion made by Council Member Laromenos and seconded by Council Member Tovar. Uh, roll call vote. Council Member Armendariz? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Laromenos? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Okay, that was done. All right. Anna Mayor? Yes. I, I want to be very clear, though, uh, because the policies that you just adopted, although they were part of the flag raising policy, they're going to be very specific to in the next couple of weeks. And I felt like I received adequate direction, but I want to repeat that back. So council is completely aware of what I understand is the commitment of city staff and myself to do uh, on June 1st. And uh, I, 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 this is very important because this is the first time we've ever done this and um, I want to get it right, but I also know we're going to have to make some adjustments, but specificity, specificity is the most important thing to me at this point. It is my understanding that Mr. Tovar is the originator of this uh, legislation, if you call it, or this move, so he's the sponsoring city council member. It is also my understanding that this event is on June 1st. It is my understanding that city staff will provide a podium, microphone, chairs, and electricity, and that a staff member of the city of Gilroy will raise the actual flag that is purchased by the city of Gilroy. Those are my understandings. So I wanna make sure to be fair to Mr. Tovar and to any other council member who does this, the next time I go down that exact same list and I tell another council member the exact same thing. So that way we have equality and equity and all those things in any ceremony that we do, uh, that would be very helpful to me as your city administrator. Understood. Okay, is that clear with everybody? Okay. Okay, Fred, dig into your pockets. <laughs> You're on for this one. <laughs> we got plenty of donors, Fred. Don't worry. <laughs> it, I'm just thank kidding. You. I know it's not. Know. This is not about the cost. I, I know. know. No, thank you. Read more about uh, yeah the need for control, but hopefully not. Great. Okay, so now we are moving on from item nine C, right? Okay, and going that brings us to, oh my goodness, what page are we on now? We're on D, Standing Report on Operational Impacts. Chief Wyatt. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council. Uh, just wanna give you a, a quick report on uh, Gilroy's vaccination uh, program as of today. Um, very encouraging news, and I'll just say that uh, the last time I reported on it, it was uh, it was pretty good. It's getting even better. Um, of the Gilroy population that's eligible to get the vaccine, that's roughly a little over 42,000. 32,000 
have gotten their first vaccination. So we're seeing a rate, first uh, dose rate of vaccinations at 83.7%. That's astonishing. Particularly when you look, in, look at the fact that the county is uh, roughly about 75%. So we're almost about 8%, uh, almost 9% higher than, than the county in general. We're also seeing um, more of the Hispanic Latino community get vaccinated. It's not as, as robust as the 83%. It's uh, roughly about 52%, but that's overall. We've seen a jump in the uh, elderly population uh, up to 71%. And that is uh, uh, one of the highest of any of the um, uh, different community groups. And uh, I'll just say that also uh, from an anecdotal standpoint, the fire department has seen a drastic decrease in um, uh, COVID related illnesses. And uh, as a result, COVID related uh, transports to the hospital. So uh, all of this is very, very encouraging. Um, I just can't uh, applaud uh, of uh, the city administrator and the council for allowing uh, the fire department and the rest of the city to join in in this uh, mass vaccination program, uh, partnering with the county uh, health department. Um, uh, they deserve a considerable amount of credit um, since it's been their program, but we've, uh, we, we have to take pride that we've participated significantly in this. Um, I'll just also report uh, specifically to the fire department. Um, we continue to participate in the uh, mobile in-home vaccination program, but we are winding that down as well. Uh, the, the calls uh, or the requests have uh, diminished uh, tremendously. We're roughly about uh, 48 or 49 people. It doesn't sound like very many, but these are all of our most vulnerable community the ones that just can't get to the vaccination site. So um, again, that's just um, speaks volumes for uh, what we're seeing as far as the recovery in this pandemic. And um, I'll also add not a single uh, firefighter in over a year since the pandemic started has come down with COVID through work. We only had one employee that, uh, that, that got it and they got it outside of work. So. Uh, all the successes that we saw early on with the city administrator um, okaying our, pur our mass purchases of PPE have, have paid off tremendously. And I just uh, can't thank you uh, enough, Mayor and Council, for your support in all of these efforts. It's, uh, it's been uh, one of the uh, highlights of my career. And I'm uh, uh, end of my report, and I'm able to take any uh, uh, questions you might have. You're muted, Mayor. Sorry. Council Member Marks. I have a question. Do you have any stats on how what, what our percentage is for those that are fully vaccinated? I I don't um I, I'm afraid I don't have that stat. I can uh, try to get that from the county. Um, they were the ones that provided me the, the latest one of 83% overall. Uh -huh. So um, I can uh, report that to you uh, probably in the next few days. Um, uh, so let me work on that. All right, great, thank you. They haven't been reporting that to us. It's been just first dose only so far, at least in the Saturday meetings that we have. Okay, okay. Council Member Armendaris. Yes, um, I just wanted, again, I, and I can't stop gushing uh, about our fire department, um, our city staff, and, um, you know, together with our county public health department staff, they just did a tremendous job at every um, vaccination site and pop up as challenging as they were sometimes. Um, and as big as they got, they were always able to, to get to scale in terms of um, uh, volunteers and the service they provide and, um, and you know, in in our case, in the case of our fire department, leading the way, like we were the first de department in the county, um, I think even in Northern California, to provide um, to provide uh, vaccines in home to our most vulnerable folks who are immobile. So, my hats off to them again. Thank you very much. All right. Anybody else? Uh, okay, um, this is something I need to ask public comment. Do we have anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item? 
If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. All right, thank you. Okay, receive report. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay, 10A we've already done. 10B, acceptance of American Rescue Plan Act funding and review and approval of the conceptual plan to restore projects and services in the upcoming biennial budget. And Harjot, you're giving us your first, I think it's your first real official report, is it not? I believe uh, our city administrator is going to be leading uh, this one. Yep. Okay. And I'll it later. I'll, I'll be All here. Right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> oh, already getting pushed out. Um, no, I did. <laughs> I have a lot on my plate tonight. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. This is uh, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, can you let, can you see my screen? Okay, I've got a short presentation. Yes, for you. yes, okay. yes. Thank you. And uh, so as you may uh, be very well aware, uh, the American Rescue uh, Plan Act was passed in March of 2021 and signed into, um, into law by President Biden. Um, it's, uh, it's in many ways a very simple, uh, piece of legislation in that it extends unemployment benefits, stimulus payments, tax credits, extends eviction moratorium and compensates for lost revenues. Um, all these items in this little paragraph are wonderful, but tonight we are gonna focus on the compensation for lost tax revenues. Uh, through various different formulas and calculations, the city of Biore was allocated $10.9 million to restore lost revenues and restore programs and services. And so in order, uh, to be able to do that, there were some items deemed in the legislation that are not eligible. And one would be salary increases for employees, uh, debt service payments, uh, pension costs to either CalPERS or a Section 115 trust. Uh, there are numerous others, but these are the main ones. As you, as you all know, 70% um, of our, uh, you know, our uh, expenditures goes to uh, staffing. And so we are limited in some ways on how we can use this, these funds. There are over 150 pages of guidelines, and I know our finance director has probably read all of them, and I've read a few of them, and we still don't understand them all, and nobody does. And so uh, there will be some reiterations of this policy. We will get further guidance, but as of today on May 17th, we're going to make some assumptions and going to make some recommendations to council on how to utilize these funds. Um, however, we're not asking council to adopt the plan this evening. Um, we are getting feedback from you. We're going to uh, listen to your, your, your comments and, and see how you worked as, as the council to steer us as the, the staff and what we bring to you next Monday in our budget study session. Um, I can guarantee you uh, that the changes are imminent. Uh, we will get more and more guidance and more and more restrictions or releasing of items uh, that helps us understand how we can use these funds but also um, we know the changes are going to are continuing to come. And we also are still trying to exactly know what the uh, el eligible uses of these funds. The, the, the recommendation that we have before you is, is been quite consistent with the language of the ARPA and all in the sense that we're trying to restore um, our, our cuts um, and invest in infrastructure, which is one of the guideline uh, purposes of the, of, the, of the Recovery Act, and uh, also take the feedback from what we've heard from Council uh, in the last few months and some of the priorities that Council has had in the last few months. The language that you see here in this chart is, is, is what we interpret the language to be right now, but it may change in some form. And for example, uh, Council has given the indication that they would like to increase funding for streets, and that qualifies under the, um, the investment in infrastructure, but we also aren't completely sure that streets qualify as infrastructure improvement. And so uh, I tell you that not to be vague, but to tell you that we are still somewhat confused and are making some assumptions that we are pretty sure will have to be further refined. Uh, the allocation in fiscal year 22 and 23 at $1.6 million gets you very close to the $3.8 million that is required uh, to maintain, to, maintain, to maintain the city's pavement condition index at 62. Uh, it has dropped significantly over the last few years. It is a concern of council. Is it a concern of staff as well? And so this is a two-year bridge 
uh, pardon the pun, uh, uh, for our streets and roads in order to try to address these uh, this lack of funding that we've been able to have. Without um, SB1, which you approved earlier, and AB1 as well, or I'm sorry, Measure B uh, as well, uh, we would be very, very low on any funding for what we have for our streets. So this is a recommendation. It's something for council to consider uh, for the next two years on how to use this money. Uh, the second component really falls under the restoration of uh, city services. And um, we went through and laid off numerous employees. We reduced our um, the cost of those employees. And such we will are recommending that we allocate 1.1 million in each of the two years uh, to bring positions back. And we'll show you those positions in greater detail on the 24th. Uh, but that would enable us to actually accelerate our recovery plan because we do feel that in, in within three years, and most economists do, that uh, the, the economy will recover and that we'll be able to be back to where we were at least somewhere close to the pre-COVID-19 days. And um, this, this bridge money will allow us to do that sooner. Uh, the most significant part though is to account for the loss of our revenues. Uh, as you know, we burn through uh, a lot of our, uh, our reserves and items like this, and we are allowed to replenish revenues. And so uh, we are still seeing that this year and next year. Uh, we expect to have a negative operating deficit. And so in order to compensate for that negative deficit, uh, these funds would allow us to maintain services and to not do further cuts. And also, as I stated before, the funds would also be able to replenish some of what we lost. So not only are we replenishing our um, reserves, or I'm sorry, our, we are replenishing a loss of revenues. We are adding positions back uh, due to this money. Uh, council previously approved furloughs uh, and concession, uh, uh, reducing those and eliminating those. And we talked about that was probably around 900 to a million dollars. So that money has already been approved for council and that uh, approved by council. And that is what we feel is consistent with the policy and guidelines of the ARPA. So that amount adds up to about 10.6 million, which of the 10.9 leaves some money for council to discuss um, concerning infrastructure, additional infrastructure investments, homelessness, housing, many programs that we've heard about from the ad hoc committee uh, that would be one-time expenditures that would allow us to, um, to compensate for uh, populations that are greatly impacted by COVID-19 and to essentially uh, do what we would consider pilot programs or you know some of the other things that council has discussed. In reality, all of this money is available to council to discuss and to, um, to deliberate, but these are our recommendations to you as we see uh, what we think that the organization really needs. And I can tell you what the organization really needs is to bring our staff back, uh, to make up for those loss of revenues and continue to invest in our infrastructure. So uh, whatever council uh, ultimately approves, and again, we're not asking you to approve tonight, we're asking you for the concepts. Um, those are the key things that we focused on. The next steps this evening is to, to get your feedback and direction, and we'll bring that back in the May 24th, uh, 2021 council study session that is next Monday. And uh, whatever direction council provides for these funds will be incorporated into the actual uh, fiscal year 22 and 23 budget adop adoption at the beginning of June. Uh, as I stated previously, that adoption will most likely require us to come back to you again as these guidelines are, are more defined and, and, and we understand them better, but we, we need to start somewhere uh, in order to incorporate this into our financial planning. So uh, the, the heavy lifting on this has been done by our finance director, Harjot Sangha, who is uh, with me tonight, and uh, we can both try to answer any questions you have, uh, and that way we'll be better prepared for you when we come back on the 24th for your budget study session. Uh, that concludes my report. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, thank, thank you, Jimmy. I'd like to do a little bit of a summary here. Uh, Peter, I see your hand raised, so I'll, I'll go to you first. But I'd like to point out for everyone that this is the money that initially we were told would be $11.6 million. And um, as you can see, we're now expecting 10.9, you know, and until it's actually deposited, you know, who knows, but okay, so it's 10, it's not deposited yet, is it, Jimmy? No, okay, so it could, so we're, we're working with the 10.9, not 11.6 that we originally told, we'll see where that goes. Uh, the $3 million shortfall that 
we've been uh, talking about that Jimmy has shown us when we, he shows us the uh, general fund five-year forecast and the amount of the reserves that we've used are a direct result of lost revenue, right? That is directly because of the sales tax revenue that we did not have. And that's the $3, mil $3 million plus $5 million that is, it was in our economic uncertainty reserve that isn't necessarily all spent. It could be 4.5, could be 4.3, it changes. But conceptually speaking, lost revenue means the, the shortfall that is in our, the labor that we need to bring back and the furloughs that we need to bring back and replenishing the reserves that we have spent because of lost revenues. Streets, I wanna point out for, for everyone to remember that 62 was a drop from 60, 69, I believe it was, right. Went down to 62 in 2019. This is 2021. We have not been doing, we have not put money into our streets since 2019 so that that PCI should not be dropping. It is very likely lower than 62 right now. So just pointing that out for people as we you know, look at all these things that, that we need to do. And, and those things that staff has proposed are just those bare minimum things that then leave us with this 300,000 that uh, we can all certainly discuss. But I wanted to at least preface with that uh, before we move on. So Council Member Leroy Munoz, you were first, then I saw Council Member Hilton and then Council Member Marks. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And to your point about the streets with the 3.2 million proposed, that's only uh, a one year you know, need that we have just for keeping the streets at pace where they are right now. That's to prevent further degradation of the, uh, of the PCI. So I, I'm right there with you. I think that's a very important one. Um, and then certainly the position ad backs is also a, an important um, issue as well. Uh, Jimmy, I did have one quick question for you. I think I know the answer to this one, but I just want to make sure that uh, that I get it right and that others hear it as well. With regard to infrastructure, that's a very broad term. Is that something that would apply to digital infrastructure like uh, broadband or Wi-Fi or things like that? And the reason I ask is because as we've seen during this pandemic, more and more people are relying on telehealth, they're relying on remote work, uh, schooling, education, things like that. Does Wi-Fi fall into that infrastructure category that we could try to improve? Yes, I, and I do believe it does. I think the bill actually specifically ad, ad, ad states the word broadband in it. So I, I believe this would be the kind of investment that that bill would support. Uh, again, don't want to give you a 100% level of confidence, but it, it does appear that it's, it's addressed in the bill. That, that's good to hear. I would certainly ask that as we consider what might uh, what expenditures we might make with that money under infrastructure, I'd, I'd, I'd ask that staff consider what broadband um, what broadband improvements might be able to be made with that money. Thank you. All right, Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mary Blinkley. Um, Jimmy, thank you for putting that together. Um, I know that staff is still has just as much workload as they did pre pandemic. And I know that getting staff back um, would, would really help. The only thing that, that mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to see um, in writing in uh, from the language is if these re if this funding is able to, you know, fill, fill back our rainy day fund and financial reserves, if that's really true or not. Um, I've heard the other side that you can't, you, you can use it for lost revenue like you were, but you can't go and put it back into the reserves. And I know you're still digging through that 150 pages, I can only imagine. Um, but that's the only concern um, out of that list that comes up for me. Thank you. Okay. Jimmy, do you want to address that or no? I, I, I can address it. And actually, um, actually, why don't I defer to Harjo? I think Harjo has a, been looking into that as well. So okay. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, this Herjo Tsanga, the finance director, uh, mayor, council member, council to response to council member uh, Hilton's question, the the interim rule uh, certainly does expli explicitly state that we cannot uh, put the dollars back in our rainy day reserves, if you will. However, it does provide us flexibility, uh, as as Jimmy um, alluded to earlier, as you know, account for replace those lost revenues to the extent, uh, you know, uh, of providing those government services. Uh, so when under that umbrella, 
as long as we have a, uh, you know, $10.9 million worth of revenue losses, again, these are point in time, starting from December, uh, you know, uh, fiscal year 19, going all the way down to December 2023. Um, so we would be able to program those dollars in, but certainly, uh, if we were to say we're going to take the dollars and, and put them in our reserves, so the interim rules certainly uh, states we cannot do that um, as a rainy day fund. And where that really helps is if we have a $3 million deficit, we're going to burn through more reserves. However, if we don't have that $3 million deficit, our reserves would be preserved. So it's, it's, it's a, going to be a little tricky, but uh, we're, we're trying to work through it. Yeah, it's a funny thing because without those reserves, we would have had another workforce reduction. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah. Okay, Council Member Marks. Jimmy, at this time, would you like some suggestions um, on, you know, how we could spend some of that 300,000? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> this is from the ad hoc committee for the unhoused. Um, we would like to see 50,000. Are we? I, let me put it this way: We're suggesting uh, fifty thousand for running the safe parking. We would uh, we would suggest that we help Compassion Center with their garbage removal because right now they're spending twenty five thousand dollars out of their pocket to do it. And also, as it has been requested by the unhoused community and our service agency personnel uh, to quality of life officers. Okay, uh, council member Bracco's hand was next. Yes, I agree with uh, council member. And um. I would also like to add uh, that Jimmy, you maybe uh, talk with uh, Tim at the Compassion Center about, um, I've been talking to him this week about different ways to get showers uh, for these folks. Um, they have a trailer that comes once a week, but that lost funding. And for the folks that live in the homeless community, that do have a job or are looking for a job, a shower once a week just really isn't working very well. So if we could like just look into something that we can partner with them in or something or anybody else that wants to partner with us. Okay, I'm gonna go to council member Armendaris and then council member Hilton, but I'm gonna point out that you guys didn't quantify everything. You just said 50K safe parking. I think you said 25K garbage removal, but nothing on the um, amount. We're talking about $300,000 here. So I just want to say that I didn't hear you uh, divvy up that pie. Oh, well, we don't want all of it. Oh, uh, okay. Because no. I, I would think with the two quality of life officers, you took it all. Okay. Well, that's true, but you know, that's okay. all under discussion. Okay. So it okay. was just kind of our wish list. And then when okay. we have a discussion, you know, right. then. Carol, point uh, point uh, uh, Carol, point of clarification. Uh, when you say 50,000, I, I thought we said, I'd read it up to 50,000, obviously. Well, yes, up to. It, yeah. not, yes, I just want to make to. sure. Yeah, because I mean, the mayor mentioned something right now. I just want her to know that we're not trying to take the whole no. pie. We're just, yeah, no, and just to keep this not. discussion moving, you know, you, I need to know how these numbers are adding up. You got to do the math. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. okay. Okay. Council member Armendaris. Yeah. Um, about the suggestions from the ad hoc committee, did we finalize and approve those? Yes. They're at the final stage already. You mean those, those, uh, those suggestions? Because I remember, because yeah. I remember there was uh, a number of additional ones that were on the list too. Um, suggestions that that myself and other council members made. Right, I'm not sure if they we would have to go back and look at the minutes. I did not, I didn't think the other two got passed. Did they, no. Come on, Fred? Those are nine. No, no, there's still the whole list, but we took the first five. You can't do everything at one time, and we we decided to take five and concentrate all our efforts to start getting 
I want to start seeing some things getting taken off the list. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, I think, oh, I was just going to follow up. Um, yeah, I think it's a small amount. So I, I would support doing some of the things off the list from the ad hoc committee um, because it's not, a, you know, it's not a huge amount of money. Um, so I, I like the idea of, um, of uh, that council member Mark said, but I'm just also wondering, doesn't the Compassion Center get money from that from uh, CDBG funds? They do, but in, unfortunately they're running out of funding. The garbage removal was a lot more expensive. And then just like uh, council member Bracco said, they lost their shower, their shower trailer because of expenses. The person providing it lost funding. So they, they have showers in-house too in the building. I'm just, you know, whatever I, oh, I support services for, right, right. Okay. for unhoused folks. But um, and I see this as it's a small amount of money. So as far as we can make it go, let's let's do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Listen. One thing I'll say about the Compassion Center too, because I've been doing an awful lot of, of talking with them and I'm speaking to their board this week too, is their lease is up where they are this year. And so if they have to move, they won't have that building. And as council member Marks was saying, there are a lot of things that they have gotten money for that one reason or another, they aren't getting this anymore or that anymore. And a big problem they've been having where they are is the need for some kind of security. And they tried to hire some security that's what they could afford, but that's unarmed security and therefore wasn't doing anything. And armed security, is what they really need during the nighttime to just deter a lot of the problems that they're having. And I wondered if maybe the city could, if one of the things we could do is help them pay for that, but there's just never enough money. So here we go. I know. Okay, council member Hilton. Thank you, Mary Blankley. Um, yeah, I, I agree with the, with the recommendations of the funding that council member Marks um, presented. And the showers thing also could be used um, at that safe parking. Um, program because I know that that's that's what they do in similar things so it doesn't necessarily have to be at the compassion center or wherever they end up at but for use over there um, and the trash collecting um, the only thing I don't support is uh, adding two additional officers um, whatever you want to call them quality of life or whatever I'm just I'm not in support of that thank you okay and um, council member Lerone Munoz where did you go you disappeared from my screen Oh, there, yeah. okay. I, the reason I'm, I'm asking you, you were talking about uh, broadband. Do you have something in mind or a number that you're looking at that part of that $300,000 to assist? I, I, I don't. I, I neglected to, to kind of do some research ahead of time. So I, I, I don't have an exact number right now. No. Okay. Okay. So uh, where are we then? Okay, maybe I'll do it this way. Um, can we give staff direction that the uh, um, conception? Are we going to take public comment? Because there's a hand up. There is a hand up? Yeah, I know it's late. How come you, no, how can you see it and I don't? Um, I have my sidebar open. Huh. Anyway, no, we can take, yeah, no, we have to take public comment on this. I was just, this is as good a time as any. It is. Christina, go ahead. Can you? Uh, yes. Um, we have Freda Kogan. You may speak right. now. Hi, thank you very much for um, taking my public comment this late at night. I would just ask um, why they need an armed officer at the Gilroy Compassion Center. I'm out there constantly um, doing outreach and I have never had um, an experience where I need an officer. I think if you want, really want to help the unhomed community, license case workers and social workers to get them proper um, casework, that would be an excellent um, use of funding because right now there are no checks and balances for the way you're using the CBG funds. And now you're paying again into the same um, same center. And I've, I've reached out to many of you, um, Mayor Blankley, um, thank you to, for talking to me while you were between flights. Um, Dion, I've talked to you extensively. Um, Rebecca as well. Um, 
but I really do think that we really need a licensed caseworker. That way they have a fiduciary responsibility to their license and the casework that they provide, that it will be checks and balances. Right now, we do not have that. So, you know, I digress, but um, yes, we absolutely need more showers. That's extremely important. But I think before you need an armed guard, you need a kind hand. And I think if they're having problems with aggression or something like that, um, maybe a licensed caseworker or social worker could de-escalate things before you start getting into having armed guards there. So I'm just asking for a gentler hand with the unhomed and extra showers. Thank you so much for taking my comment. Certainly. Are there any other public comments? Yes, we have Jan Burstein. Um, you may speak. Okay, hi. Um, happy to see um, that uh, our house community is making the list. Um, and I would ask for uh, just time for more public comment on um, the uh, the ad hoc committee's uh, recommendations. Uh, I know there there was a, it wasn't a public process for a long time, so we haven't had a chance to suggest everything that uh, could be needed. Instead of um, quality of life police officers, I, I think we need outreach workers. Uh, you know, an outreach team um, who can uh, address people not as a not as a, a police officer it, it, it's not about policing the homeless community it's about helping them off the street um with with compassion um and i i might suggest that anything that's done uh be a competitive bid process rather than um selecting where where funds are going up front thank you thank you are there any others christina not at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just say what I was going to say before, and then Carol, I'll let you, before that public comment, because I, I suspected public comment was going to be in regards to exactly what it was. And what I was going to ask before that is if there is council consensus, if we could get it, it piece, piecemealing this, is there council consensus for staff's conceptual <laughs> recommendations on the items above that, on the streets, the position add backs, the accounting for loss of revenues and the furloughs. Is there consensus for that? And consensus does not mean unanimous, it means most, most of us. So can I have a thumbs up for those who support that part of it? So I see one, two, three, four, five. I see all thumbs up except for council members Hilton and Armendaris. So, okay, so staff, we have, Jimmy, there, that's direction on the 10.6. Now let's continue with the discussion on this, on the ad hoc committee and everything else. Okay, Council Member Marks. I just wanted to clarify two items uh, in response to Jan. No, no one group has been promised anything. You know, they, these are just suggestions. And for any group that's going to service the unhoused with city money, there will be an RFP that goes out that Jimmy will handle. And the quality of life officers, I just wanna make that very clear, was did not come from the unhoused committee. It came from the actual unhoused in the encampments because they kept telling us over and over how unsafe it was, how the women could not sleep at night. There were a number of rapes, and molestations and abuse. And they were the ones who said, we need help out there. And they wanted an association with the police officers that they could bond with to get the criminal element out. This came directly from them on numerous conversations. Okay, just wanna make that clear. Thank you. Okay, and since I mentioned the um, security, at the Compassion Center, I would like to uh, say for anyone listening to that um, that's coming from a couple of sources. Um, one is uh, the landlord, but it's because of it's all, it's it's even more so in just talking with um, how to help the community be more welcoming 
of things that involve the unhoused. And that kind of confidence for the community comes when, they're, when they feel that there's protection from the things that can happen that shouldn't happen. So one is where they are right now, wanting the landlord wanting security there to see if that would make, if that would improve what that landlord has to deal with. And there are quite a few police calls that go out to that site. And then the other is to just help with, with how people perceive, right? When there's, when there's protection, when there's, uh, for many, they feel safer with officers around. I realize there are those that might feel differently. I myself feel safer when officers are around. Okay, so that's the, the best I can explain that one. Are there any other uh, comments now from, from council? Okay, so we just need some sort of direction on, or, or Jimmy, or is that enough? Do you wanna leave the rest of it open? Yeah, Madam Mayor, I think that's plenty. Um, thank you for the support council. We'll incorporate that feedback. Uh, as was mentioned, you know, the quality of life officers is something we'll bring to you. Uh, one, it does not fit in this money and also would be more of a, also a policy discussion as well. So um, we're, we've gotten that feedback from council. Thank you. Okay. All right, so enough said on this one. Is that what we're saying? Moving on. Okay, that brings us to, wait, this says I'm supposed to do a roll call vote. I am not, am I? It says I need to ratify acceptance of the American Rescue Plan Act. Andy, do I need to do that? Uh, let me ask Jimmy what, what he mean, what, what the ratify acceptance really means. I think the council's clearly indicated yeah. that we're accepting the money. So I'm not sure if a formal action is needed. Perhaps Jimmy or Harjot can comment. Yeah. The the uh, the purpose of that action really is is because it's a 10.9 million dollars. You know we're going to contractually obligate the city to spend those dollars in compliance with federal uh, guidelines. So um, you know from a dollar threshold, I think it's appropriate that the council approve and authorize us to accept those dollars. Uh, I think with that explanation, then then we sh should have a formal vote on that issue. Okay, so do I have a motion to ratify acceptance of the American Rescue Plan Act Award? That's it, that's all I need to say, right? So moved. Second. Okay, yes. moved by Council Member Leromagno, seconded by Council Member Tovar. Uh, roll call vote. Council Member Edmundetis? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Leromagno? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley. Yes, that's unanimous. All right, item C, appointment to the vacant seat on Parks and Rec Commission. Okay, so we had the interviews earlier tonight, everybody. Uh, let me get out my little tally thing. Okay, so, well, I'm, I'm so, council member, do council members have any questions before I go to public comment? Okay, then I'm supposed to go to public comment. So Christina, are there any comments from the public on point, this appointment of this vacant seat? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. All right, thank you. So that brings me to um, possible action, which is to appoint a member to the vacant seat on the Parks and Rec Commission with the term ending December 31, 2022. So I'm going to go down the list here. And when I call your name, please tell me who, who you're voting for. Armendaris. Um, Efren Pineda. Bracco. <coughs> Council member Bracco. Efren. Say again. Efren. Okay, sorry. Council member Hilton. Efren. Wow, Councilmember Leroman Yos. Nicole. Okay, Councilmember Marks. Tony. Councilmember Tovar. Efren. Yeah, and that, I wish I'd been first because I could have told you that's who I was going to vote for too, Efren. So he got five votes. He is our new commissioner. Uh, thank you, Christina, or whoever else is tallying. I hope you got the same number five, five votes. 
Yes. Okay. And thank you to Nicole and to Tony very, very, very much for applying. Always tough, tough choices. Okay. Item, oh, item D, we don't need to do everybody. That's 1091 that was pulled. So that is gone, yay. It did not guarantee Gilroy and Morgan Hill anything. Okay, uh, item not, uh, sorry, item 11. Oh, I have to adjourn to the meeting of the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority. Is that right? <clears throat> okay, so that's what I'm doing. And now what? <laughs> Now you have to open this meeting of the okay. Gilroy Public Financing Authority, of which you are all members of the board. Right. This is so, okay. so all, we're all the same members of this. So now I am. Uh, so I just adjourned. I, I adjourned us to the meeting of the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority. So here we are, Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority Board of Directors. Roll call of the Board of Directors, please. Council Member Armendariz? Here. Council Member Bracco? Here. Councilmember Hilton? Here. Councilmember Lara Munoz? Present. Councilmember Marks? Here. Council, uh, Councilmember Tovar? Here. And Mayor Blakely? Here. All right. This is a, a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority declaring intent to reimburse costs incurred in connection to wastewater capital improvements from the proceeds of bonds to be issued by the authority. Arjot, are you doing this one? That's correct, Mayor. Okay. Arjot Sanger, the finance director. Um, the item before you is a consideration of a resolution to uh, adopt by the board of directors by the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority, declaring its intent to reimburse the costs incurred in connection with the wastewater system capital improvements and uh, including the expansion at the regional wastewater uh, treatment facility, which is owned by the South County Regional Wastewater Authority, also known as SCRA. So the uh, Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority uh, was created uh, specifically to finance the costs of any capital improvements, working capital, or other liabilities or insurance needs. Um, back in the 90s, uh, the authority from time to time has issued bonds to finance the projects and so forth. Um, we are currently pursuing a uh, wastewater bond issuance to finance the costs of the city of Gilroy's portion uh, for the uh, treatment plant expansion. Uh, uh, according to the rules and regulations uh, under, the, uh, under the federal bond laws, uh, we are uh, allowed to reimburse ourselves for uh, costs that are incurred uh, on a project that's going to get uh, financed by those bond issuances. So because um, the SCRA board has already awarded the construction bid uh, starting in May, so we're anticipating the uh, costs are going to start incurring here uh, this month, uh, and we're probably not going to be hitting the markets uh, probably for another month or so based on our current schedule. So adopting this resolution uh, kind of covers us for that interim period. Uh, so that's the resolution before you. In addition to that, you know, we're allowed to recoup some of our staff time that we're spending on our efforts as well as uh, city attorney uh, time as well. Um, other than that, uh, that concludes my uh, report. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions that the council or the board of directors may have of this authority. Right. <laughs> okay, board of directors, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Um, pub apparently, there can be public comments for, to this board. So, Christina, are there any public comments? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. All right. Thank you. Uh, that comes back to council then. Would anyone like to make a motion to adopt a resolution? Move adoption of the revolution. Resolution. Not revolution. revolution. Very, clear, very careful what I say. <laughs> okay, uh, I heard the motion. Was that a second by anybody? Second. Rebecca, second it. Okay, Leroy, Council Member Loromenios made the motion. Council Member Armendera seconded it to adopt a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority, declaring intent to reimburse costs incurred in connection with the wastewater system capital improvements including the expansion of the Regional Wastewater Treatment Facility owned by South County Regional Wastewater Authority 
from the proceeds of the bonds to be issued by the authority. Uh, is that a roll call vote? It doesn't say. Yes. Okay. Yes, it should be a roll call vote. All right, roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Board member Adam and Yes. Board member Bracco? Yes. Board member Hilton? Aye. Board member Laura Munoz? Yes. Board member Marks? Yes. Board member Tovar? Yes. And board member Blankley? Yes. All right, that passes unanimously. And with that, we adjourn. We adjourn to the meeting of the Gilroy City Council, which brings us back to city administrators reports. Mayor, I have no report this evening. Okay, city attorney's reports. Okay, uh, I have a brief report in, in honor of the lateness of the hour. I will not go on at great length about the Surplus Lands Act, although I could because it's, it's so complicated that I'm sure you would be fascinated to hear more. However, um, I wanted to explain why we pulled an item off the agenda, which was the uh, potential consideration of an exclusive negotiating agreement relating to the 536 acres. And the reason was the State Surplus Land Act. This is a uh, state law that's actually been in effect for many years. However, it started out with relation to open space only. And the concept was that when public entities disposed of property that might be developable, they should let open space interest know about it in case it could be preserved for park use or something like that. What's happened in the last couple of years is it's gotten changed to be primarily a surplus lands act for the preservation of possible affordable housing land. And particularly effective last year, there were state amendments that uh, strengthened it considerably from the standpoint of the state and uh, put additional hoops that the city has to jump through. And in addition, a, the enforcement agency is now uh, the Housing Community Development Department, HCD. These are the same people that uh, beat us up over arena numbers and that we have to comply with for many other relate, things relating to housing. So now, and HCD just finally issued guidance a month ago about this, which sharpened up some provisions that we didn't think applied, but now they do. So the net effect is that with some exceptions, which I won't go into unless someone's interested, if, the city, if a city is going to dispose of surplus property it must, they must send a notice of availability to HCD and to a long list of housing developers. And you can go on the HCD website and see there are all sorts of people who've registered with the HCD to get these notices. And we, we, we have to essentially say this land is maybe available for housing or maybe not. Uh, and we have to offer all of these housing developers 60 days within which to respond to us and say, well, I'm interested, here's my proposal for a project. If the city gets any responses for a piece of property, we then are required to enter into negotiations in good faith for a period of 90 days with potential responders. We're not required to make a deal. We are not required uh, by the state law to actually agree to do, uh, to sell the land to one of these uh, housing providers. However, we must in good faith negotiate whatever that actually means. And what's changed in the law is that now we're really supposed to do that before we negotiate with a prospective buyer that we may have found out about privately. Because in the past, what's happened is the city typically gets approached by somebody who's interested in buying a parcel of land and the city might not even be thinking about selling it. And we start talking to them now we're really not supposed to do that anymore. We're really supposed to stop and decide whether we're gonna declare this property to be surplus. And if we are, then we can't negotiate anymore until we've sold, until we've sent out these notices of availability and gone through a negotiation process. So the, the, the whole uh, period, the whole uh, sort of time frame for selling properties has changed. And really, in theory, before you send out the notice of availability, all you're supposed to do as a city is kind of do some feasibility work, like appraisals or some due diligence, that kind of talking to brokers, that kind of thing, but not active negotiation. So the net result is that this now, with, as it has been strengthened in, in the last year and with HCD's enforcement powers, 
really puts uh, kind of a monkey wrench in all property disposition processes. And so we're really caught up with the 536 acres and also with the creamery, by the way, is another property that could be subject to this. And so we will have to bring back to you a, uh, a, a proposal to consider the land surplus for example, the 536 acres that was on the agenda before tonight, uh, in order to decide whether it's essentially available to be sold. And if so, we'll have to go through a process which will cause a number of months of delay. And again, this is overall, this is part of the states ratcheting up the pressure on cities to approve affordable housing. We have to notify HCD before we dispose of property now. We have to do a yearly inventory so the state is monitoring all cities quite closely and they've been given additional enforcement power. Anyway, that's the short answer. There are a lot of ins and outs. There's some things that are not well understood by anybody, but we are gonna have to go through the process. And so I thought it would be a good idea to just let you know that this is now another procedure that applies to us. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise we will be coming back to you relatively soon with uh, further proceedings. Yeah, I, I do, Andy, because I'm, I'm asking myself how, I mean, how much is this um, stalling this process that seems to always get stalled? I mean, we've gone the RFP. So I, I mean, I, I, I'm asking because, you know, I'm going to be going through the same thing, right, with our, our ad hoc committee for the Sharks, trying to do whatever we can do with the sports park. And I'm asking myself, how different is that? <laughs> Then well, I think that is different. I, I think that's actually different because okay, the, sharks well, would be hear that. the sharks would be operating a facility at our sports park, assuming we're not selling them land because it's part of our sports park. If we, right. if we maintain ownership, there are ways, for example, with municipal golf course, we can have a contract with an operator to operate okay. the golf course. And that's not a disposition of property. Well, I'm assuming so that in dealing with the sharks, we will be, have to work out an agreement that again, we're, we're, that would not be either a long-term lease or sale of property, but the city would retain control. We'd have some kind of public-private partnership with them. We'd have to be careful and think about that closely, but my belief is that that's a different kind of project. But okay, so some of these projects could be different things. For example, if the city decided that we want to develop the 536 acres ourselves and hire a company as a management company that would somehow be compensated, that might be feasible. The reason that we've stopped put a hold on it is that the RFP we sent out did explicitly talk about the possibility of a long-term lease with some company, the way we have with Gilroy Gardens, and that would be subject to the Surplus Land Act. It wasn't clear that it was until you okay. the act is ambiguous. This is because, so HCD, this is because uh, of a long-term lease. Yeah, a long-term lease. Actually, HCD says any lease over five years which is kind of silly because you know if you if you're leasing property for 10 years it doesn't mean you're really getting rid of it but nonetheless they're putting a short time fuse on it no but with the with the sharks given that we'll own everything you know you're going to have to they're going to need some kind of lease well they'll to... need some kind of agreement with us that i that we presumably will not end up calling a lease i would think but we haven't gotten to that point yet, but we have to- No, start. but we, we're, okay. I just want to get, these things need to get out in the open for that too, because I don't want to, all right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, we'll have to, we will have to start seriously thinking about that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Now the idea of putting affordable housing in the sports park really doesn't make any sense. And, and we, even if we went through the process, we would not be forced to do that. Well, I, I don't, don't see how it makes sense up in the mountains either, but okay. <laughs> I just say most of that acreage is in the mountains. <laughs> no, it is. There is flat land, however, that is potentially developable. But, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Anyway, that's the story of the Surplus Lands Act. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Andy? No. Okay. Andy, is there any other part of your report you wish to give? No. No, that's it. We're on. Okay. Right. Thank you. So then with that, we... Um, go into closed session. I think uh, maybe a five minute break is in order. Is everyone good with that? 10.05? Well, yeah, why okay. don't we, may I suggest that we, we read the agenda item, take public comment as we normally do first, and then Please. assuming we're going to closed session, then, then take a break. Would you like to do that? 
Well, I've got the microphone here, so I might as well continue, I guess. Great, thank you. All right, there are three closed sessions. One is conference with legal counsel for existing litigation pursuant to section 54956.9 of the Brown Act, uh, the government code, and Gilroy City Code section 17A113A. The case is J Joseph Fashi versus City of Gilroy, uh, United States District Court, and the case number is given on the agenda, filed December, January 7, 2020. Then there are two real property negotiation uh, closed sessions pursuant to government code section 54956.8 and Gilroy City Code 17A8, 17A.8A2. The first one concerns uh, 6490 Auto Mall Parkway. Negotiator is Jimmy Forbus. The other party is Mike Conrado and it's price and terms of payment. The second one is pursuant to the same code sections. The property is the 10th Street Bridge. Uh, APNs is given in the uh, agenda. The Thomas Luchessa Bridge, also APNs given, and the new fire station. Negotiators are Jimmy Forbus, and the other party in negotiations is Glen Loma Corporation and John M. Felice Jr. Negotiating price in terms of payment regarding purchase and sale. Now we need to take public comment, if there is any, and then we need to vote to, I, I, I uh, with respect to the, the first item, am advising the council that in my opinion, it would prejudice the interests of the city to discuss these matters in open session. So the next thing to do is to take public comment, then take a vote to go into closed session on the litigation matter. Then when we get into closed session, we have to take a vote to stay in closed session on the other two matters. Thanks to the OGO. Oh, okay, Christina, do we have any public comments? If you wish to speak on any of these items, please press star nine or raise your hand at this time. See none. Okay, right, thank next you. Next step then is to take a vote to go into closed session on item A, the conference with legal counsel. Okay, am I allowed to make the motion? Okay, council member Bracco. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, I made it. Council member Bracco seconded it. Okay, we everybody approve going into closed session? Yay. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Now Great. we can take our break. When we go into closed session, we'll vote to stay in or not. Okay, everybody. So it is, it's 10 o'clock exactly. So 10 05. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. 